Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is a school district of Upper Dublin Board of School Directors Facilities Committee meeting. It's November the 19th, 2015. It's 9 o'clock, and we're in the Cardinal Room at the beautiful Upper Dublin High School. Um, I'm Joseph Shimoleski. I'm the uh, committee chair. Also with me uh, this morning, uh, we have Sarah Rothman, who's also on the committee. Dr. Levinowitz is here. Um, we have our um, superintendent um, of schools, Deb Wheeler. We have Brenda Bray, our business manager, and Jason Gerdeman, our facilities manager. Uh, welcome all. I'd like to call the meeting to order. And um, there are no presentations uh, this morning. Uh, are there any announcements or communications? Not at this time. OK. Um, we have minutes from October 22nd, 2015. Uh, we've had an opportunity to review those. We'll, we'll uh, move those along to, um, to our legislative meeting. And that brings us to our facilities report and recommendations. And the first one is GKO Architects uh, regarding the Thomas Fitzwater Elementary School uh, cap um, vestibule design, capture vestibule design. So, uh, Ms. Bray, would you like to take over on that? Certainly. And this morning we have uh, with us uh, David uh, uh, Sumata. Samita. Thank you very much, David, from GKO Architects. He's going to give a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation and talk with us about uh, the plan for uh, Thomas Fitz. As everyone probably remembers, uh, it's a little more complicated to uh, turn to deal with security. And uh, so instead of having the project completed last summer, we were looking at completion in the summer of June 2016. David. Thank you, Brenda. I'll start by um, discussing kind of the current conditions of the school and sort of the challenges that we'd like to address as part of this project. Uh, the first being coming in from the exterior at the main entrance, you'll notice that there's a slight curb. So we'd like to address that as part of this project and make the entrance accessible into the building. And then the second item is, is once you enter the building, the security or um, the visual control that the corridor and office has on that main front entrance. As you'll see in the second photo, the main office is actually tucked away at the back end of the main corridor, and there's really no sort of security once a student or adult enters the building. There's no se second set of doors. You kind of just enter right into the school hallway system. So those are a few things that we're looking at addressing as part of this project. How we'd like to do that, um, I've, I've outlined five things on this floor plan. This is kind of the floor plan we're using moving forward. One is we'd like to build a sloped walking surface at the front exterior of the building that will allow people to get from the current sidewalk up to the elevation that the building is at, which is around five and a half inches higher. The second thing is we're adding a secure set of vestibule doors that will kind of enclose this front area as a vestibule and provide protection from entering the main school corridor system. The third thing we're doing is we're moving the, the main office area to the front. <clears throat> That's the kind of open area in this first photo to the right when you immediately walk in. So we'll bring the main office and secretaries and personnel up front. We're able to create a small assistant principal's office as part of this. And then as a result, where the old conference room was, we relocated it to the main office on the backside, provided some additional file storage for them, and a connecting hallway between the existing workroom and the principal's office. A few items we're looking at um, evaluating as part of possible alternates for this job is one, to create an ADA accessible restroom. Currently, the principal's restroom is non-accessible and, and to provide some kind of accessible facility there. And the second thing we're looking at is new furniture systems for that main office. We were able to take the existing furniture system and place it into the office, but doing a new furniture system will probably be a better workflow and better layout for uh, the secretaries working there. To give you kind of an update on where we are as far as our project schedule goes, um, we completed our building survey. We completed our initial round of schematic design options. We went back and forth with Jason and the school principal, talking through some different ideas and different concepts. We're currently in the design development stage. 
So they, they've kind of selected one scheme that they'd like us to pursue further, which is what you saw a few minutes ago. And then once that scheme has kind of been resolved, we've kind of identified the parameters of the project. We'll go into our construction document phase. We anticipate eight weeks to complete that. And then uh, the bidding phase, which is another six weeks, is typically advertised for three. It's awarded or um, the bids are received. The school, the school board votes and acts upon it and awards. So that, that total process we estimate being about six weeks long which gives us kind of a, a target of mid-March to award contracts and which should be ample time to begin construction at the start of uh, the summer in June of 2016. We anticipate that this project, due to the relatively minimal scope, could be easily done in the course of the two-month summer. Just to give you an idea of kind of the initial budget costs and where we think this project is, we use the rough number of 130 to $150 a square foot. We're looking at roughly a thousand square feet of renovation area, which gives us a construction cost range of 132 to $153,000. Obviously, as we kind of refine our design and begin the preparation of the construction documents, we can always select items to become bid alternates to give the board flexibility on, you know, how how much they want to accept as part of this project. So that's that's all from my presentation. Any questions, comments? Any questions from the board? I guess I'm just uh, wondering, how do you come up with the average renovation cost of 130 to 150 square foot? We actually did a line by line itemization of the different materials involved, what we think, um, you know, like the wall construction costs, the, the floor material costs, the painting. We actually took an itemized projection of this project because it's so small in scope and then kind of reverted that back to a dollar per square foot number. Um, it's, it's challenging in these smaller renovation jobs because the dollar per square foot for what seems like a minimal renovation does escalate just because the scope is so, so refined. Um, but that's how we actually got our number. We, we started with a, a spreadsheet and we kind of itemized, you know, how much is a new do door worth? How much is the hardware worth? You know, how much is, is the walls, the ceiling materials? We kind of all itemized that, kind of assigned a quantities and dollar per square foot numbers. And that gave us a, a total. And then that total averaged out to be 130 to 150. Okay. Any other questions? Um, that order. Any uh, HVAC work going to be done in the project, especially in the uh, new office for the secretaries? So the, the, the existing area does have perimeter rating heat. The intent is to provide a split system HVAC unit similar to what's in the conference room now. Uh, our understanding is that would be purchased by the school district, installed by the school district, once we can verify that the electrical capacity of the building can accommodate the additional loads. Yeah. We, we plan on all MEP or HVAC work to be, to be self-performed by the district. Okay. A similar type of installation that took place over at Fort Washington. Okay. The, the tile work that's on that wall now, what, what are we going to do with that? When you walk in, there's uh, tiles on the, on the wall. Is that going to just be ripped up or is that going to... Are you talking about... Yeah, that tile yeah. this feature here. Yes. Yeah, we can look at it. We're creating an opening next, or we're not opening up the entire wall, so we can look at the extent of that tile work and see what we can do to to preserve some of that, if that's the school district's intent. Mm -hmm. And and then the uh, the gym front side door that would just always be locked, I guess, because that that's in the middle. Right. Corner. Well, yes. Jason asked us as part of this project to provide new doors and hardware at, at this door as well, just to make sure that this vestibule is, you know, secured at that point. Okay, and, and then lastly, it, this is considerably a lot more money, than, I believe, than what we spent for the other buildings. And do, do you know offhand what the other buildings cost us? Um, Roughly, um, Jarrettown or... I think Fort, uh, Fort Washington was relatively around, with, with the HVAC work that we did at house, was about thirty, about forty thousand um, dollars, and then Jarrettown itself was what a doorway mm -hmm. and an opening. Um, that was about fourteen thousand dollars, because there's no HVAC work included in Jarrettown's scope last and, summer. And Maple Glen. And Maple Glen was minimal, right? We, Maple we Glen was the, door. the year prior, and that was right. probably about ten to twelve thousand dollars. Again, that was just a doorway, a door frame 
uh, with three doors that were installed at that time. Here we're actually modifying the actual office space mm -hmm. to create a conference room to put new floor tile down. Um, there's much more work uh, with this scope as compared to the other, to the other schools. And mm -hmm. one of the things I w would like to point out, and I'm sorry, Dr. Levinowitz, um, it came to our attention that um, the entrance out front for handicapped access could be changed. And that wasn't really part of our initial uh, conversation. And uh, certainly Jason can tell you more about how people that are, uh, folks that are in wheelchairs cannot come in the front entrance. So okay. this will rectify uh, that particular so challenge. So to rectify that and to create an, an ADA uh, restroom, is that part of the base bid or are those uh, add-ons? It can be decided by the board how they want to take it. Our recommendation as part of this project will definitely be to improve the ADA at least entrance aspect to the building. Uh, the restroom we can package up as a separate item so that the board can decide whether or not they feel like it's feasible. The restroom doesn't have a direct impact on the rest of the project, so that could be also done at a later time if the board chooses. Okay, so, so but but the ramp, let's say, coming in, is that part of the 132? It is, correct. 153, yes. and the restroom probably is not? It, it's not right now in that number, no. And initially, though, I just wanted to point out, when we started talking about this, we did not have the ramp in front as even part of the project. No, it's funny, because you don't notice it unless you are told to notice it. And, yeah. and, and we have different yeah. ways of approaching that front entrance. Um, one example is that we can just do, sorry, we can just do a minimal ramp as part of the base bid, just mm -hmm. the five foot wide kind of ramp up and then take an alternate to extend that across the entire walking surface just to give the board flexibility uh, when the final numbers come back. Just a comment, we're working on a project at Eastern, and one, once you start getting into your buildings and working, it's what they always will be looking at is at least one ADA-compliant restroom. So that's what Eastern had to do, totally separate from the cosmetology. We had the recommendation from G, uh, GKO was, was to have an additional restroom uh, uh, you know, in, the, in the building because we didn't have one. We had a small one in some classrooms. In all fairness to GKO, did, did you shop around this? It seems like a lot of money. So I'm just wondering if we did our due diligence in terms of looking at other options. I just want to make sure we did do that. I know we were looking at a number of options and, and the costs, uh, but you're, you're confident that this is the way we, we need to go and we wouldn't be able to find an option that would work for all of us, you know, less than 130 to $150,000? I believe other options explored um, set the security doors at the far end of the hallway. Mm -hmm. And we determined that we did not want to have anyone having access to any part of the building prior to that second locked door. Okay. Yeah, you basically, yeah. since you're moving the, the, you want to create the secure vestibule space, that moves the second set of doors towards the front of the building. And then in essence, you almost have to take the main office push it towards the front to accommodate that feature. Okay. It also allows for better space, utilization of space via conference room. The conference room in the building right now is rather small and not accommodating for the group meetings that they have. So in, in a way, you get two bonuses out of it. You get the, the vestibule space, which mm -hmm. you want. We, don't, we want a secure space for entering in the building. And also it gives better room accommodations to the current staff that is there because also a new vice principal was added and there was lacking room to accommodate that person. Okay, and again, no, no change at all to, to the principal's space? Correct. That's, that's the same. Okay. Jason, do you have an idea how much the HVAC is going to cost? Um, In-house, we performed over at Fort Washington mm -hmm. a similar size. Um, since we're installing it, the equipment is about $7,500. Okay. And then it's our own labor to put it in. Okay. As now, that is just for the main office. As far as the, um, the, the ramp front entrance... Um, um, does that also include, because you, you have a, a canopy that rests in that area, does that include um, s modifying the supports of the canopy? Because you've got, if you ramp it down, you're going to need to make up that distance. Our intent right now um, is that existing posts here will stay in board of that so we won't disrupt the canopy structure and we'll just kind of ramp up to that 
that second landing there. So all of our work is planned inboard of the canopy structure. Okay. All right. Um, and I, I think it would be good to look at. I think it would be good to look at, um, you know, an alternate for that for that area to just have a um, a smaller ramped access for uh, ADA accessibility uh, because I, you'd be looking at basically tearing out that existing concrete in that whole area and redoing that and um, that could be you know rather rather expensive for something that we're really not getting a whole lot of utility f uh, from uh, if we can just go with a smaller uh, ADA access um, we could save that money anyway but I like what we're doing on the inside of the building I think we get a lot more uh, utility there uh, with the space uh, that currently really isn't used uh, just on the inside of the the front entrance and bringing the uh, uh, the office area closer to uh, to where people are coming in, so we can uh, have better security in that. So, uh, overall, in the in the interior of the building, I think I think it looks good. But the exterior, um, I don't th I don't think if if we had no problems on the inside of the building, we wouldn't be knocking ourselves out to do that kind of work at the front entrance. If we had an ADA. Uh, accessibility problem we would probably go with something r rather small and so I, I think we should look at that okay and um, just to kind of summarize we can take a look at the building as a whole with Jason um, right now to renovate that principal's office into an ADA restroom could be potentially costly just because of the limited size of that restroom so we can look throughout the building to see if there's another restroom that maybe can be right. modified with a lot of minimal work um, being done to kind of give you that accessibility but not at the same price tag okay all right so it's it's still somewhat a work in progress uh, as far as final design is concerned in that um, and, uh, and we look forward to to seeing uh, you know what what comes from this but uh, you know I think uh, it's a good project and one that uh, certainly needs to be done so that uh, all of our schools have uh, um, uh, good safety uh, um, structures sure. uh, to, to uh, control everything so that's good so do we have a, other, uh, do we have a motion then on uh, at the next legislative on this or anything to go out to do anything? nothing N not at this point not in time. at this point okay okay any other comments or questions on this all right thank you very much thank you all right next item is a discussion of the uh, Thomas Fitz roof drains um, yes, uh, currently we're still exploring um, the conditions we have with the building. Um, we are going to do a little further excavating to expose all 12 lines that are in the front of the property. And then we're basically uh -huh. going to take a, um, a television probe with um, creates a magnetic field associated with it and insert it into the lines and try to trace where these lines run from the beginning of the building to out to the exterior where they tie into the culvert itself. Okay, uh, just to stop, just so we refresh people's memory or, or some people that may not be aware at all, um, this problem uh, uh, was uh, discovered how? Uh, ba basically, during some uh, grounds work, we found that there's sub subsidence of soil at one location. So we went, it, went to further investigate, um, dug it up, and we found that we had some roof drain lines that were damaged. Um, so we need to repair those, and in the course of investigating them, we found that the, the, the extent of the damage may be further into the building, so we're not sure. Um, so before we actually um, refill the holes after repairing these lines, we want to make sure how far back the line damage is so we can make a repair for the whole system and not just a 20-foot a section where we're currently at right now. Okay. Uh, on the roof itself, where the r roof drains, or the penetrations in the roof for, for drainage is, um, when it rains, we don't, we don't get ponding there, do we? It's no. We just, over the last, this past summer and the previous, we just replaced probably three-quarters of the roofing system on the building itself. So we have much better rain water drainage than we had previously. So there's really no ponding on the roof itself. So it's the water is going somewhere, but yes. it's not going where it's supposed to be going. Correct. Well, we're not sure where it's going. That's <laughs> what we're going to investigate and find out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So anyway, so, uh, so you're running lines with cameras through to determine 
uh, the extent of the damage, right. exactly where these lines are located so that uh, you know where to start digging when, when Correct. Time so comes. following that investigation, we're going to determine um, what we have to repair and how much and how we should go about doing the work so it's not to affect any DEP or EPA regulations with regards to storm water runoff. Okay. Whose backhoe is that? Is the that is Hirschberg Mechanical's backhoe out there it's right theirs. now. Mm. Yeah, and more or less we're going to sub to a larger contractor to do more excavation work there. Okay, because it's been there for a while, right? Yes, so we have had <laughs> two engineering firms come out and take a look, Snyder Hoffman as well as Cohen Associates, uh -huh. give us um, information on what they recommend we do. And so given what their recommendations are, that's how we're proceeding. Okay. okay. So... Um, when will we, uh, when do you anticipate we'll know I, what, what we need to do? Hopefully by Wednesday of next week, um, we have a full plan going forward on how to actually make the repair. We're looking at them coming out either Monday or Tuesday of next week to investigate the line's location. Okay. All right. Um, so it could be that this project may be ready for board approval in December? Correct, yes. Okay. And, right. and actually, it may be a ratification if we find yeah. out that, uh, because obviously right now it's warm, we can get into the ground, we can do some work, um, we may be communicating and, and then asking for ratification. Okay. I'm trying to be optimistic about this. All right. <laughs> See how it goes. All right, great. All right, any, any other questions or comments about that item? All right, let's move to the next one, which is a discussion regarding ongoing Upper Dublin High School heat pump issues. Um, currently, we've done a lot of heat pump repairs over the last year and a half, uh, more so than we had previously. Um, these are relative to uh, a heat pump is a HVAC unit that conditions a classroom. So basically, each classroom has one of these units. And the large rooms, like the one we're in now, basically there's a larger unit on the roof that satisfies larger conference room type areas, like the auditorium, a gymnasium. Um, but what we found is through we have a geothermal system which pumps water from a field out by the stone lot into the building, and that water is used to help temperate the heat pump operation. Um, what we're finding is we've had a number of failures with compressors and the coils that receive the coolant, whether heating or cooling, are fracturing as well. Um, to the point of, uh, we would probably see a significant amount, close to about 30 compressor failures over the last year and a half, which is an enormous amount of money with regards to repair costs worth in companies here on a regular basis. How many do we have? How many repairs? Co compressors. Uh, compressors in the building, classroom-wise, there's, there are 187. Okay. With regards to rooftop units, we have, I believe, like, I want to say uh, 16, and each one of those 16 has, given its size, between two to four compressors within them. Um, so what we have had to do over the last year and a half is do a lot of repair work um, to, to, to the extent of we want to find out um, what we can do to mitigate those repairs. Um, we've had discussions with Worthing Company about mechanical or related solutions, um, solutions in which would clean the water that is associated with the geothermal loop. Um, they're finding a lot of material in the water still. Um, it could be debris left over from construction. It could be just caused by the chemical reaction of the water that was used in the piping that reacts with the glycol system that creates clogging of the pipes, in essence, which affects the geothermal pump operation. Um, so one recommendation we received was to put a, filter, a filtration system just on the geothermal loop itself. Um, so I'm taking various bids right now, get an idea what the cost is, and then from there a discussion further say, is it really a necessity to put this system in? On the other side, we're looking at an, an electrical solution. It's not necessarily a solution, it's a, a recommendation that we believe is creating other problems in the building. Um, in the installation of the infra electrical infrastructure in the building, we have stepped down transformers that take a higher voltage to a lower voltage that basically gives you the 120 you use to plug in your computers um, or run the lighting, or excuse me, your computers or to turn the lights on your classroom. And there's other step-down transformers that use to provide power to the rooftop units, the large pumps we have, and the heat pumps throughout the building. Those step-down transformers, we, the district, when purchasing, did a good job. They have harmonic filtration on them. 
but only to um, the third harmonic. And that third harmonic basically is lower voltage 120 volt equipment. Your computers, all that type of 120 volt plug-in type of equipment. What we didn't, what the district did, or wasn't designed for was the higher harmonics. The fifth, the seventh, and the ninth. And those are the issues that we're seeing being created in the building with regards to uh, interference, uh, larger harmonic fil filtration throughout the building, which we think that could create larger voltage spikes that could make equipment vibrate more, which could cause equipment to fracture, have cracks, coils cracking, as well as damage compressors that they're seeing too high of a voltage periodically spiking when they receive their power to operate. So we have had one company come out and investigate, and indeed, the power factor that we have, power factor is a, let's say it's an easy electrical calculation that shows how well you receive power in the building from like Pico. Um, ours is relatively good. But once you get past that system in throughout the building, we have a lot of interference, it's really poor. You want to have your power factor between like 0.95 and 0.99 inside the building, it's around 0.7. Um, the harmonics that we've seen is you will usually design, well, I've just learned about this, the harmonic level is about 5%. Ours is about 30%. So currently, I'm still in, in, this, in the investigation process. Once they come forward with talking to other consultants, um, we would like to probably bring forward to the board a recommendation on some sort of harmonic power factor filtration system to be installed throughout the building, as well as a recommendation mechanically of what should be done to help clean the water that's currently in our geothermal loop. So hopefully I was able to explain it well enough that there's two types of solutions we're looking at to help resolve this problem um, because the costs are relatively high that we're seeing on a monthly basis just to keep the classroom at 72 degrees. And if, if I could jump in before we go from the very technical back to questions. I've um, I've heard about harmonics and these type of issues in, in, in other districts. Um, but uh, it's very interesting how facilities suddenly becomes chemistry and physics um, and making everything work harmoniously so that there's uh, no, no implications on, first of all, the equipment, just because we need that to have comfortable students and faculty in the classroom. Uh, it also helps when your director of facilities is an electrical engineer. So um, we've been in quite a few meetings, and I think, uh, and please ask all kinds of questions, but just know that we're in the early identification. We'll be working on this with other experts as well, uh, and there'll be future board motions, I'm certain, but nothing, I, I can't imagine anything in December at this point in time. No, not, not at this point. We're just bringing it a project that's <coughs> going on in the background. Um, in the olden days, say 20, 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> we have another engineer in the room. Uh, we? if, if we're running heat pumps and things that we're doing now, um, my guess is we probably wouldn't be running into these harmonics issues because from what I understand, we have a lot of variable speed drives uh, in the building. And variable speed drive, uh, basically it, it takes um, the... Um, the frequency of the electricity, which is normally 60 uh, hertz, and changes it to um, to give you a different speed. So if you're instead of starting a motor up from zero to 100 and, or 1750 RPMs, it may ramp it up gradually. So it's it's a lot easier on the all the mechanical stuff and everything else. But in the process, um, it it potentially could could create some harmonics issues that you're seeing with, with this equipment now. And from what I understand, we have a lot of these variable speed drives. So you have a, lo a lot of things going on in the electrical system um, in 2015 that you may not have seen back in 1985 or something like that. Is that yeah, yeah, we have about 64 VFDs on large equipment. Um, and, and really, it's an idea of, to, to, a lot of times it saves the motor with regards to slowing up the speed and gradually raising. It also reduces energy with regards to how much power uh, an piece of equipment uses, but didn't quite realize the noise, the harmonics that it, is created by that variance of the consistent voltage. Right. So it's, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to understand a lot of what you're talking about unless you are an electrical engineer. But I think 
what we're seeing is that the building um, is designed in such a way that there's probably some unanticipated consequences that are, are being realized now uh, in some of the systems that normally wouldn't have a problem, except that we have a different kind of electrical system today than we did years in the past. Correct. Is that fair to say? Correct. So anyway, so you're going to be doing some studies um, to determine the extent of the problem and potential solutions, and then it's, uh, it's for us to decide based on cost um, and, uh, and uh, uh, potential solutions uh, whether we should proceed. Uh, when do you expect you'll be able to, to come back with uh, something definitive to the board? Um, I'm uh, hoping that probably in January to have something together, uh, a concisive idea of what would resolve our issues here in the building. Okay. And, and you said that there's an electrical component uh, as far as solutions. There's also the mechanical component. And um, is it possible that if the, you know, because you've said that some of these electrical um, uh, conditions in the, in the building are, are such that they're way out of where they should be, is it possible that the electrical will take care of everything and it won't necessarily be a, a mechanical issue? I, I think the, the electrical would definitely um, is, the, the, is the main solution here that I think is the cause of most of the problems, especially when you're seeing repeat heat pumps that are failing. We we've have actually have a heat pump that failed three times in a matter of four months. So that is something, but there's also the aspect of the, the water with the geothermal loop is not clean. Um, and that's where that you need something in place to filter that out that would probably within five, six years, it'll be completely clean and the system actually becomes obsolete, not needed because it's a closed loop. But it's at a point that it's, it, we do see those problems being generated by uh, dirty filters. Okay. Um, one other uh, side right. question. Um, as far as the, um, the fluid in the, in the loops, is there any requirement or recommendation uh, that that be drained and, and refilled periodically? No, there's not. There's okay. no requirement for that. Okay. All right, good. Any other questions or comments on this item? You know, when a heat pump fails, the, what typically, you said one of them failed three times. The, is it just the repair of the unit itself or a new unit coming in typically? Yeah, usually what happens, it's either the compressor or it's the piping that ties into the coil that actually provides the heat or cooling or the actual coil itself. Mm -hmm. So in rel most often it's caused by vibration, mm -hmm. excessive vibration. And with the compressor, it's just an operation of <clears throat> if there is improper um, geothermal water flow that has an effect on how it operates to the point that it could basically suck its fluid too much that it goes air dry and causes damage to uh, the coil or the, the compressor itself. And a lot of times it's from vibration, and we've, we've seen electrical damage, too. So it's, it's it, it, and the reason that's why we're going with both different directions here, both me mechanical mm -hmm. resolve an issue, or a solution, as well as electrical, because it's a, a combined issue right now, is what it appears. And the obvious question is, I'm sure we're past any kind of warranty period on any of this equipment? For, the, Pretty much the warranty has ended with the last, last section of the building with the Performing Arts Center. But oh. we've asked for an extension through Worth and Company. We uh. have had some warranty work done yeah. and replacement right. oh, yeah. in, in the past. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have the, the installer, you have the equipment, and we've had conversations with, uh, you know, a lot of players in the room. Uh, but then we also have the fact that technology has changed so much and the amount of lower voltage use that we have in the building, no one could have anticipated when the, they started to design this building, and you two would know, nearly, you know, eight, nine years ago. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. did I summarize that correctly? Yep. So it's, <laughs> it's worth, I mean, worth was the original sub on this, on, on that. Um, yes, and they've been thoroughly involved with helping us resolve what the problems are. They've given us idea of solutions. We actually met with the, the vendor, um, Tri-State McQuay. We, br we brought them in. They, it was, it's now become Daikin. We've gone over possible issues with the systems itself. Um, and of course, they came through with the geothermal loop not being fully clean, um, preventive maintenance issues with regards to cleaning strainers. Mm -hmm. and that that's where the side stream filter would help. 
um, but they didn't bring up about anything electrically. We, I recognize that fact through Airmark that <coughs> we've, we've installed power factor correction systems in various buildings and we've have found out rather good results with geothermal type systems which are mostly electrically operated. Um, as well as I brought in a, the vendor who provided the step down transformers in the high school. Um, he's gone through, did some testing and verified that indeed there is a harmonic issue in the building. Uh, basically, he expressed that at the time of design, they, there's about, I think, nine step-down transformers. They all get, they can all, they're all handling at least the third harmonic. Now, this is a little more electrical engineering stuff. If, if each step-down transformer was phased properly, it would eliminate the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth harmonic, which you relatively wouldn't have the electrical issues we're seeing right now. Mr. Arnold can't fix the issue. He has a very <laughs> harmonic choral group. No. 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 Different harmonic. Yes. Did and I was going to actually go to the physics area. Oh, <laughs> I just go to music. Right now, the building's not in tune. That's correct, yes. Um, so you said there's about, been about 30 failures in the last year and a half. Do we have an idea of what that's cost so far? Um, for, I know exactly. Okay. Uh, fourteen fifteen, it was sixty-one thousand um, dollars. The year before, it was twelve thousand, and just this past three months, it's been about eighty thousand dollars. And more bills are coming in. Right, but um, along that line too, um, from our conversations, which actually started in June, and we've had several meetings, uh, Jason more so, but I've been involved in two, two of them. Um, we're looking at, uh, we're having conversations with Worth about discounting or giving us a credit for some of the current year's expenses. Mm -hmm. They are wanting to be a good partner. Um, they've been helpful uh, at some of the meetings with the equipment manufacturer, um, and we've had some good conversations with really everyone. But it is very easy when you're sitting with a group with different interests to have a lot of finger pointing. Well, and sometimes it comes back to us, and, and a party that's not really even involved would be the source of the water, you know, and how, how that goes in, and what it's the, what's the chemical reaction um, that takes place depending upon the source of the water. It's complicated. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad we're, it's certainly a, a front burner issue, um, and I'm glad that you're working on trying to develop solutions and uh, I'm sure you'll keep at it until we we get it solved yeah um, and something's happening and we'll find out why and get it fixed I'm certain of it so thank you for that uh, any other comments or questions on that item all right uh, next is the 2016-17 uh, general fund budget uh, discussion uh, regarding uh, preventive maintenance um, and before Jason uh, jumps in with the details behind it, this is actually a small part of, of the budget. It's just another one of those conversations that's taken place about some things that we need to put into the budget. And, and within facilities, we'll be able to probably, this won't be, be an increase. I just want you to know that these are preventative maintenance uh, items that we will be looking at for next year. So if you would like to explain further or in detail where I was just talking about the money? Um, uh, yes, listed here are basically four different categories. Um, we have not performed preventive maintenance in a number of years, uh, probably because of cost reductions. Um, and I'm looking to reestablish these programs um, relatively, our elevator wheelchair lifts. We should be inspecting them on a monthly basis on our own. Right now, we're just um, coming out and performing repairs on an as-needed basis when we have a problem with the system. Um, the electrical distribution systems, we've done uh, a significant um, inspection this past summer of all our main entry points into the building, but on a relative yearly basis, we should be inspecting and cleaning our systems um, given that the age that they're currently in. Um, so that's why I was hoping to see if we can do something like that in the near future. Um, and the next, of course, is mechanical HVAC equipment. Um, the maintenance staff is minimal. We have three people on staff right now, um, and it's rather difficult to do outside of normal work order corrective work for all the buildings. Uh, preventive maintenance is something that falls behind, and that's something that we're hoping to reestablish 
uh, again, whether uh, in-house or uh, an outside entity to help us perform this needed uh, work. Um, it's significant issues at the high school here are relative to not having a preventive maintenance program in place. And we're really helpful with the age of our equipment to keep uh, <laughs> a longer lifespan within that. Um, and then lastly, the plumbing systems. We had an, a condition over at the administration building recently with the, the sewage injector pump system failing. Um, we did not have um, water bathroom usage for a number of days. I think it was about four days. Being that the system, we had to wait for a pump to come in. It had to be overnighted, uh, and it took three days to get it in. So again, those, that's just an example that if we were on top of it, we would have known that the backup pump didn't work. One pump failed and the second one wasn't operable. So hopefully um, more discussion is taking place or will take place about providing these programs in place so that we can keep our buildings living longer as well as to reduce our costs with all the repairs associated with that come about with lack of maintenance. Uh, um, we, uh, we did have our um, budget crunch uh, a couple of years ago and um, you know, of course, when you have that sort of a circumstance, um, you know, you do cut back on things, and unfortunately, uh, some of this preventive maintenance work was part of that. Uh, we need to, you know, we do have a responsibility uh, to keep the integrity of the Capitol um, uh, buildings uh, good, and, uh, and if we haven't had the money in the budget in the last couple of years, we certainly need to put it in there now, and it's, it's not just a matter of of hoping, but it's a matter of applying the proper resources uh, in the budget to get this work done, and then um, and then using those resources um, uh, wisely to either uh, hire additional people if people are available to do this work at the at the price uh, you know at the rate that's uh, offered, or bringing outside people. But certainly the work's got to be done because. Um, it's kind of a pay me now or pay me later. You can get by, and I've, I've been in maintenance for a number of years, you can get by not doing certain things for a period of time because you're in a crunch for whatever reason, but you, that can't be a forever thing. It has to be a very temporary thing, and then you get back, and generally in order to, to get back to where you need to be, you have to pay more money up front to get things settled, and then after that, you know, you can... It can be a little bit more modest, but if we're, if we're in a uh, a situation where preventative maintenance uh, issues are are rearing their head, we we've got to get on top of this re relatively quickly, uh, or or all we'll be doing is chasing problems for forever. So. And and just to follow up on that, uh, what happens in a district when um, and part of this has to do with Act One and um, things that were far beyond the control of the local school board. Um, when you're in a crunch and money's limited, the first thing that's cut in any district has to do with um, facilities. It's, it's at the time relatively um, seems harmless and you, you don't notice mm -hmm. it. But when you're coming out on the other side, when you're trying to go back in uh, and start to t tend to those uh, items, it becomes a little more painful. And while I talk about a number of those items, really we can, we can take care of within the existing budget. Um, if you look at our, um, the amount that was in facilities, the 2600s for repairs and those type of things over the years, we've, we cut out a half a million dollars in a few years. Uh, we do need to increase that, obviously, not all in one year. So some of these items will not probably even take board approval. The preventative maintenance work will be so low, you know, to have somebody come in. Um, but if it isn't, if it needs to be above the threshold for quotes or whatever, we'll be bringing it forward in future months. Yeah. I mean, we have a good building here at the high school in spite of the, the issues that we're dealing with with the, uh, the heat pumps and that. Sandy Run, uh, we're not spending a whole ton of money there because we don't know what we're going to be doing uh, long term. We have three out of, out of our four elementary schools which are really old and need constant attention. So, um, so yeah, uh, for, for a period of time we can get by uh, without spending money uh, for preventive maintenance, but uh, in the long term we need to budget ourselves accordingly. Um, you know, um, the elementary schools are going to need constant work. Uh, Sandy Run, once we have that capital project finished, 
things should be in pretty good shape there. Things should be in pretty good shape here. So I think if we, if we budget appropriately to take care of the problems we now have, uh, we can pretty much stay at that level, not have to increase much beyond that because things will, will start to settle out. But we need to get a jump from where we've been in the last few years up to where we need to be uh, in our budget for, for uh, preventive maintenance or, or, or we'll constantly have problems at these schools. And, um, and sometimes it can be catastrophic as it was at the uh, administration center where, where you can't operate. So uh, we don't want to go there, particularly uh, in any of our schools. So we've got to get after it. And it's, it starts with the budget. Any other comments or questions on this item? But at the, at the same time, Mr. Shimaleski, just to point out that we've done, you know, some quite a few projects in, in the elementary schools. I don't want people to think that we've they've been ignored. I mean, we've we've done significant technology upgrades in in, in the buildings. We've done roof projects. We're looking at boilers, uh, the windows, and we still have Fort Washington to look at. But we've done, you know, significant work in in, in those elementary schools. Yes. No. I'm I'm not talking mm -hmm. about project work because I mean we we do those things on an ongoing okay. basis but the the day-to-day -day routine maintenance right. um, work is where we're lacking right now through budget through staffing um, and and those those things it's a, it's a, a thousand little cuts mm -hmm. and um, and eventually it can kill you so we have to take care of those things so the, the big projects we've, we've been doing work we've been doing windows we've been doing roofs uh, the security systems, you know, lots of things in all of our schools, but it's the, the work orders, it's the preventative maintenance. So those are the things that we need to get after. And, and right now we're, we're not doing it to the level that's, that's necessary to, uh, to be excellent in that area. And Dr. Levinowitz, your comment just brought something to my mind. Those projects that you were talking about, those have been funded out of bond funds. Yep. And so that's a different pot of money, and perhaps I should have said that. What I was speaking of earlier was the general fund. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a perfect scenario, we always have so much uh, for repairs and maintenance in the general fund because those are items that are routine and will not add to the life of the building. Items that we take out, the projects, the windows, the roof repairs, um, trying to think of some other things that we've done, asphalt, those type of items, they'll last 20 or 30 years, and those can come out of bond fund. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on this item? All right, next is number five, transportation update. Uh, transportation, while we don't need a separate committee for that, um, can fall under uh, facilities since it's a type of operation. So I just wanted to update uh, the board, um, th and particularly this committee, public too, that uh, we are, we have a contract for our current bus um, garage in its location at uh, 275 New Jersey. And um, we also have, uh, which is unique uh, in Montgomery County, a um, shared services agreement with Springfield Township School District. And occasionally school districts look or have same challenges. And parking school buses and, and where um, that can be located is a challenge for both Springfield as well as Upper Dublin. Now, Upper Dublin, we have a lease on a property, and it's it's annual, and it's coming up as of June 30th, 2016. Um, so Springfield Township um, and uh, Upper Dublin looked at some property or had some conversations about perhaps um, sharing a bus depot um, and further combining uh, cost. But keep in mind, although we're adjacent school districts, uh, there is some distance between where they're located and where we are located. And after some um, conversations with not only in transportation, but between the business administrators, last week um, they said no thank you as too far as sharing, uh, trying to find something in Upper Dublin. I also should put on, the, on a comment out there that uh, I'm sure everyone would agree that bus depots or bus garages are not exactly something that townships, particularly in residential areas, would look forward to embracing. So there's uh, uh, a limited number of locations. But we, we are looking 
um, and there will be other conversations um, trying to find um, an alternative location. Um, but that contract is coming up. Just wanted to put it on everybody's radar that we're having, um, that we're looking for someplace else. Um, and that may not happen, but it's something that's ongoing. Also with Springfield Township School District, bus specifications. Um, I spoke with our solicitor several months ago, and um, there's no reason why we can't issue joint specifications uh, to buy buses, but the specifications have to be written more carefully or a little bit different twist than if the school district's offering them for themselves um, entirely. So right now, specifications are at Springfield Township School District's uh, solicitor's office for review and tweaking. Um, we probably will have a couple of options in there within the specifications uh, comparing costs for outright purchase, which tends to be the way districts buy or have their buses, or a lease. Uh, usually a lease is not as favorable, but we'll uh, hopefully through the process be able to clearly lay out, which is le less expensive. Uh, we also will be looking at a number of sizes of buses because um, what works for um, private parochial schools or independent schools and what we need to transport our public schools, uh, the sizes are different. And then there's also the special education um, requirements or needs for um, some of our students. So the specifications are at that solicitor's office. Once they're ready to be shared with us, we'll send them off to our solicitors just to be certain that they're all on the same page. And um, be moving forward with advertising and then uh, looking to buy, um, you know, four probably full size buses. And by full size, I'm going to leave it to the experts to determine if that's 84 or 72 passenger and then probably a micro bus, uh, something smaller with wheelchair accessibility um, in it. And of course, we can determine after we open the bids if we wanted more or if it wasn't really within budget to buy let's say five buses. And just to be clear, that is not coming out of the general fund. That would be a capital um, projects or capital reserve, excuse me, purchase. Okay. Um, on, on the uh, uh, bus bid specifications, there, there's no such thing as like a co-stars? No, unfortunately, there, there isn't. <laughs> well, I mean, you would think that, you know, uh, a bus is a bus, sort of, you know, with, you know, variations on the theme. You would think you would have... Uh, uh, quantity discount, uh, uh, you know. You raise a very good question because, um, as I'm sure you remember, we have purchased d dump trucks and uh, pickups off CoStars. Yeah. But so far, um, and it may be because there's not too many vendors and they don't really want to get into that, and perhaps the cost is greater in the southeast than it is. I, I don't know the reason. I just know that they're not available on CoStars. Uh, um, is, is there... I'm not exactly sure where that comes from. Is that out of Harrisburg somewhere? And is there somewhere th that we could talk to people and say, hey, you know, why, the, why don't we do this? Uh, the vendors have to be willing to do that. Okay. Um, I, uh, but although you raise a point that perhaps we could contact CoStars or uh, a group of business administrators or something and ask them to consider at least putting together a bid. Yeah, okay. Uh, just one um, clarification. Four buses and one micro bus, those would all be replacement buses. We yes. would not be ad expanding oh. our fleet. Mm -hmm. You are exactly right. Uh, and we have been, no I'm sorry, ahead. we've been a, a number of years uh, not replacing buses because we used to have a, uh, a pretty specific uh, number of years uh, for each bus, and every year we would, would replace just a couple. And then, again, during our budget crisis, we didn't buy buses and so now you know I'm sure the mechanics are doing a great job keeping these buses we have on the road but but now we're getting to a point where something's got to give again and because of the shared services agreement sometimes um, we do use buses from <coughs> our um, share them with uh, Springfield Township but yes um, as with anything breakdowns are more frequent and um, we we need to replace uh, the the buses. And when I first arrived here, the replacement was at least three a year, full size again, 
replacement and then usually um, a van or a micro bus. But that wasn't every year. That really depended upon um, the age and the mileage on those vehicles. Mm -hmm. Some community members ask about leasing buses. And so we did look at that. And it, we're actually um, at least the thought, now this is what went to the attorney, I don't know what will come mm -hmm. back, is that we would even have that within the document, okay. that so it would be very clear at a date certain, as of the bid opening, what, you know, compare okay. uh, purchasing versus, versus leasing. Lease. Okay. And when do we need to make a decision on the uh, current garage? Um, that will need to be, um, there are two ways we can go with the current garage, a multi-year lease versus a single year. But that also falls into the March 31st, April 1st uh, okay. time period. Okay. okay, any other questions or comments on transportation? All right, uh, we have one other item that uh, was Mr. not on Shumilesky, the agenda. I'm sorry, I, d I didn't quite do all my transportation. Oh, oh, the, the other one is just uh, software training. Um, oh, right. It's... Um, we have the software, we're trying to set up training, actually more challenging now, is, find, uh, is acquiring a 911 map uh, from uh, the county. And, and, and why do you, you would wonder, do we need the 911 map? Um, it's very specific, it has all the addresses in it, uh, and it's updated constantly. And it's not really the map, it's the electronic information that we're after. But we need that not only for our Upper Dublin, our own school district, but for the areas surrounding that we also have children going to. Um, and there's a large fee that both Springfield Township and Upper Dublin are trying to avoid. Um, so we've been working together trying to get all of those maps. Now Springfield being closer to Philadelphia needs all of Philadelphia. And um, we don't. 10 miles doesn't take us to all the schools, uh, which is required under, uh, I think it's Act 320. Um, so uh, we're working on obtaining the electronic map. And then secondly, um, even within our old um, system, we have, of course, records on all of our students, but our, um, they're entered differently, addresses, not the students' names or anything I'm talking about, but abbreviations. For example, how many ways can you abbreviate lane? How many ways can you abbreviate drive? So we need to have uh, and look at that, um, all of the data within our system to make sure that we are consistent with what's on the 911 or what's on the map, the electronic map, so that we have a perfect mesh. So we're starting to um, scrub plans our own data, and we're t uh, talking with Peter Valachi to see if we can use our electronic capabilities more to try to update some of the, um, the information within our system. And then training, um, I don't have a date on that, but there has been conversation back and forth. Again, we're trying to train both Springfield and Upper Dublin uh, at the same time. So this is um, the system that we, um, we purchased last year and, and we said it wasn't going to be at the start of this school year, but during this school year, we we're going to ramp up and mm -hmm. start to go f away from pins on a, on a map to something electronic, and then we'll get the utility from that uh, as we go forward so that in, in um, succeeding school years, uh, things will be scheduled um, electronically, and, and it should be a lot better because we can design our schedules in a more efficient manner? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it will also, um, the information will be more readily available within the student software. Um, parents will be able to access, there will be more security around, um, you know, bus stops. And there will be a number of, of um, enhancements, I'll say. Some of them will be cost savings, is, is what I'm looking forward to. Um, making sure that, and, and uniformity, that we have stops the same throughout the district for elementary. Now there's going to be differences for elementary versus middle school and the high school. Okay. I always kind of think, move around when I mention transportation and bus schedules. So I just want to be careful and, and make sure we're thinking very carefully how we're going to proceed uh, next year with, with the schedule. If we're planning on implementing trapeze next year, if we're going to run the two systems simultaneously. Parallel. 
Yeah, parallel. Are we going to look at trapeze now to see how it would have uh, mapped this year's schedule and what would have been different? Just, just want to make sure that we're planning as much as possible so we don't create a situation that I think we had a couple of years ago. Last year and then four years ago with yeah. the Montgomery County Transportation. Yep. Um, Westchester School District mm -hmm. uses yep. Yep. this, and they have a, a, a yep. very large area. So, um, and in fact, um, this week, I contacted the Director of Transportation last year. I had a couple mm -hmm. of conversations, but our staff now, um, Mr. Huffnagel and mm -hmm. Mr. Brooks, have been having conversations. Good. So there's... Well, what did they, how did they approach the 911 maps and were they, did they have to pay or do we know what they did? Um, they're, they're different uh, oh. in the fact that they ha had software before that. Oh. So it's, and so they were current with that. It wasn't an issue for Westchester. Okay, any other comments or questions? Is that everything on transportation? Yes, I'm okay. so sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, there, there's one uh, additional item uh, on our agenda re regarding utility costs. Yes, and uh, I apologize. This is actually as a, is as a result of a meeting at the IU yesterday. Um, Mo Montgomery County Intermediate Unit has, um, for a number of years, purchased diesel fuel and heating oil, back when districts used that more than natural gas, um, in a consortium. And that has, with all but one year at least that I've been in the business, uh, served all the school districts very, very well. And by that I mean the cost per gallon of diesel fuel was significantly less than what you could go and buy at a retail sh shop. Um, and then as electricity and natural gas became our, uh, deregulated, there was um, financial ways to um, save money and keep looking at how we acquire um, electricity and where we actually, um, who the vendor is, uh, who's the uh, dealer, if you will, for electrical. And while PICO, which is local and transmits it to into our buildings and everything, we actually buy our um, electricity from a company that's in Pittsburgh, Direct Energy. So I give that as a little bit of background. Uh, and we've locked in for the last few years on natural gas with a company called Hess, but they've been, now been sold to Direct Energy. Perhaps more background than everyone's interested in. But for a, a few years, there's been a group in Montgomery County, 12 school districts, um, and uh, we're looking to try to expand that. So there's now a new subcommittee. And we work with a couple of um, uh, professionals, Direct Energy being one, but always keep in mind that while they, um, they're a broker, they're also a dealer. And then we would work with a company out of um, Houston, Texas called Amarex. And um, they're nothing but a broker. And they, they send emails almost on a daily basis with things like El Nino and, and what's the temperature of the water in the you know, Pacific and how that can impact, again, um, utility costs. Um, so... Uh, I'm sure everyone's aware that right now there's natural gas flowing in Pennsylvania, and natural gas is, um, as it's been referred to a number of times, at an ultra-low level. Um, so a little bit like the interest rates, now's a good time to um, lock in for bond refunding, but it's probably going to be a good time to lock in on natural gas. Electricity is going to take a little bit longer um, to um, determine that, but based on conversations yesterday and conversations with Amorex, um, we may very well be coming forward with um, a motion on December the 14th, actually a ratification, depending upon um, what price we can get and how much we think we might vary. Uh, the longer you wait in a heating season, the price starts to go up, or could. And it, right now, with the very, very mild November that we've been having, it would be a good time to lock in. So I may be coming with a motion asking for ratification for two years and um, hopefully save a great deal of money. Okay. Any questions on that? Um, you mentioned you were at the IU. Um, is this in conjunction with or separate from the IU and what they're doing? Um, right now, the IU is focusing more on electricity than what they are on um, uh, natural gas. I think we'll get there with natural gas as a group. So this, uh, what would be coming, would be um, a separate relationship. Um, I've worked with Amorex or, or I've been in meetings with them for, for probably 
10 years. Uh, and, and different school districts work with them um, throughout Montgomery and Bucks County. Um, so this would just be based on the recommendation of Amarex outside the IU. Okay. But I wanted to bring in the fact that the conversation did take place there okay. and with, the number, with about seven other school districts. Okay, so everyone's well aware of, of the players and, and the advantages and, um, and trade-offs and everything. Yes. All right. It's complicated too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, you know, what a number it? of years ago, you just bought, you just paid Pico. I mean, that's all you did. Um, and um, deregulation means that I watch the NYMEX and consider, um, you know, transmission and those type of things. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Anything else uh, yeah. before we go to community input? Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I I keep looking at that, and I, I shop around for my electric, and I urge people to look around and try to get a better price than Pico, because you still get the Pico bill. It's just a different supplier of the supplier. energy. Mm -hmm. I just switched over again. I had a question. I was in Fort Washington's uh, elementary school, something I called the greenhouse, uh, in those two corridors. Again, even la last week, this 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 week, I should say, and it, it demonstrated again and reminded me about the heat that's generated in in that greenhouse corridors and I'm just wondering if, if we were looking at you know an, a, a quick option because some people did mention the film that you might be able to put on the windows or when I looked at the windows themselves you know even shades or something that can keep you know keep the heat and the cold out so I'm wondering if that's that's on the list somewhere to to look at uh, yes I've, I've been in contact with I believe it's NRG uh, who is a large um, supplier of films okay. th with 3M um, and looking to have them come out hopefully during this winter time frame to see what they can do to a, an application of a, f a film on the windows Great. to help curb the heat. Super, thanks. Good. Anything else? All right, this is the time for community input. If anyone would like to address the committee, uh, step to the podium, state your name, section of the township in which you live, and the four minute rule well, is in effect. I'm here, right? <laughs> uh, Ginny Vitella, as if we don't know, right? Ambler. <laughs> And I love that uh, save significant amount of money quote. I love it. I'm going to highlight it and remember it. Um, I worry about the film. I love the idea, but will that pro prolong us getting new windows? So if <laughs> we dump money into that. Um, back to the original big, very confusing um, thing, which, you know, was so complicated. I don't really get it about the water and the filters and the repairs and 37 units and everything else. This is our newest building. And like with Maple Glen, I get worried. Why, why aren't these all things discussed and looked into at the beginning when it was being built? I mean, this is our newest building. It's costing us so much money to keep these systems going, um, like with oh, the heating and air conditioning situation in Maple Glen that costs us so much money on the newest, but let alone these old, old buildings we have to deal with. So some of the questions that popped in my head was like, why didn't, they know, why didn't we know the source of the water? It's right there, right? Why weren't the filters or electrical solutions required before? Um, and with these repairs, wouldn't this company, when we're dealing with getting a contract, um, can we press harder? Like if you want our contract, we want longer repair warranties or something. I don't know, I don't know how it works, but it just seems crazy on its newest building that we have all these problems. Um, and of course, longer warranties, which I kind of refer to. The Thomas Fitzwater, the water drain, which is funny because you probably because you fixed the roof, now you see all the water draining, right? And uh, we talked about that. Um, but does this affect the kids and the property on a daily basis? Is this water running into the playground or something, or is this just some sort of area in the front of the building? Like, is this a priority expenditure at this point, getting this water? Because I know certainly at Fort Washington, just because I know that fast, there's water drainage issues around the building, but, you know, we deal with it because it's not like you have to step through a you know, five-foot puddle to walk in the building. So I wonder if that's a priority. That's, um, and know you talk about this preventive maintenance, um, getting back to that. Is that something we were able to do in-house? I don't know if that's, you say general fund, is, that, is the majority of that cost coming in-house or that our people can do? I don't know. I don't know what's involved. Um, the depot, see I had nothing to say. The depot, is there anything wrong with the current location? Because like, you know, as far as residential areas and everything else, I love the fact that we have that commerce area for that, for those buses to be kind of tucked away on an otherwise very unattractive piece of property. Um, that's it, pretty easy, right? Okay, thank you. 
All right. Um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to address uh, some of the uh, the issues uh, that you brought forward. Um, when it comes to the, the actual high school itself, I mean, it, it's been five years now, um, and when the building was constructed, there's a warranty period on the equipment that is purchased, and usually it's one year after it's installed. There's a warranty associated with it, or sometimes additional warranties can be purchased up front for additional years. Um, and I can't say specifically, but I, I believe it, all we had was a one-year warranty with the equipment, and they actually extended it to us on certain areas of the building, which we have had experienced equipment problems. So like we've already stated, some of this stuff just came out of warranty, and it's been, I think, three years since the, the building was fully completed. Um, wh when it comes to the water, um, the Ambler water is what we receive, both at this building and at Fort Washington, and it's not the cleanest. Um, and my understanding is that's the water that was used um, with the geothermal system itself. And at the time, there wasn't, I believe, maybe a study done on the water and how it reacts with the glycol agent that's used in the geothermal loop itself. That was just recognized recently with regards to these issues. Um, and hopefully we can curb that with a, a filtration system um, on the system itself. And when it comes electrically, um, the design of this building, as was stated, was about 10 years, five years before it was constructed. A lot of things have changed in that time frame, especially with harmonics. It's, it wasn't, it was somewhat recognized, it appears it was somewhat recognized at the time it was designed. It's just no one can really um, understand how a building will react electrically after all the equipment is installed and then runs on a continuous basis. A lot of times engineers size equipment to be larger than what is needed just for the potential of expansion of rooms and stuff like that. And that in itself creates more interference, more harmonics. And it's just something you, you plan for but not fully recognized until after it's constructed. Um, and as for Thomas Fitzwater, um, the drainage problem at this time looks to be contained to the front of the building. So we're in, just in the, in the investigative process right now. And that will determine how we react to fix the problem, whether it's a large scale issue or a smaller scale. And but it's but the, the, front, the front of the building is not where cars are going. It's, it's in the lawn area after the front, yeah. so it's not affecting yeah, it's, it's traffic the, or it's anything in the building. Yeah, yeah, it's between, the, it's right. between the, the parking lot in the front and the sidewalk where no students reside and play. Um, in regards to permitted maintenance, uh, currently um, we're staffed with three individuals and looking to do, with a, in the course of understanding what we need to maintain throughout all the district buildings, not just the high school. That's where uh, we're trying to determine what is the best way or solution fiscally as well as um, a means to get it done in time with regards to maintaining the, all the equipment, not just the high school. And, and one thing um, with the construction of the high school, if, if say you were building a car, okay, you build a car, you design it, you build it, you, you roll it out and you see what it does. And you see all the things that it's not doing right. And then you go back and you redesign it and you do all that. Before you make a gazillion of them, you make sure that one is, is right. Well, this is one high school. And, you know, it's not like you're going to roll, roll it out and, and then try to fix it before you send it out there. It's just you build, you design, you build it, and, and hopefully everything went pretty well. And, and really, in the scheme of things, it went great. But there's been a few issues that uh, no one anticipated at the time. I've talked to Jason about once we do identify and fix this problem, we should go back to the architects and say, hey, look what we experienced. Because, you know, information is, is valuable. Maybe, maybe we don't gain anything from it today by, by spreading that information out there. But in their design, they'll look at things that maybe they didn't consider when this school was built. And ultimately, at some point, it may be designs that will be done for Upper Dublin School District. And knowledge of electrical systems and how things interact with each other that no one considered years ago and is important today, I think will be information going forward that, that will be of value to all districts. So we're finding our way through this, trying to keep this car on the road um, and it will stay on the road, but, you know, uh, we're, we're shaking out some bugs, and we'll get there. Um, okay, 
any other comments uh, with regard to community input? I think the only other question was about the current bus depot. Mm -hmm. um, how much are we spending currently on that contract for the bus depot? Um, all in, uh, and that means expenses, not just the lease payments. It's about $360,000 a year. We do not own the bus depot, uh, that parcel of land. So um, we're always looking um, to, you know, do better financially. But in addition, it is a tight space. It is small. Um, our, our people that um, administer, you know, the transportation, their, um, their office is, is in a... <laughs> We have issues at times with uh, technology just because of, um, you know, we're only leasing it. We're not uh, tied in 100%. So there, there are challenges and, and reasons to look um, to move if we could find a place. Okay. Anything else? All right. Uh, well, uh, our next uh, facility meeting is going to be December the 17th. It's a Thursday, 9 a.m. Uh, here in the Cardinal Room, and if there's no other comments or anything, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much for uh, coming this morning. Take care. Good evening. I'd like to call the uh, Finance Committee meeting to order. It's November 19, 2015, 6.02 p.m., and, and we are in the Cardinal Room of the Upper Dublin High School. Notice of this meeting was published in a newspaper of general circulation at least three days prior to this meeting. We uh, will go a little bit off the uh, published agenda in terms of the order uh, tonight uh, due to some traffic problems and bad weather. So uh, I'm going to call on Mrs. Bray um, to introduce, well, I'll go ahead and Mr. Mr. Ogden. Thank you very much. And hopefully uh, the presenters from uh, Public Financial Management will be here um, within a few minutes. Um, first, uh, we have a uh, contract with the villa. We've had several years that we've operated with the villa. And we'll be taking that forward to the board um, for approval on December the 14th. Uh, this evening, we have Mr. Michael Ogden. He's the Director of Children's Services for Public Health Management Corporation. And if you look at the contract, you'll notice that we actually um, are contracting with uh, the Therapeutic Center at Fox Chase. He's also CEO of that organization. It's the second year that we've really been involved, or Mr. Uh, Ogden has been uh, directly involved with the villa. And he's here in case there's questions that he might be able to answer. Um, and I will be happy to highlight a few changes um, and major points of the contract uh, if it interests the board. Do we have it? Do I have it? Is it here? I don't see it in here. Yeah, I'm um, looking also. I apologize if it was not shared with you. Um, you will obviously all receive it afterwards, and but I can tell you um, perhaps the high points and some yes. changes, and then yes. Mr. Ogden can certainly answer questions. Yes. Um, and we have met several times in working and uh, coming to agreement on this contract. Uh, the board will be interested to know that there is um, some new language regarding placements of children at the Villa Academy, particularly uh, regarding a court order. Um, and uh, another point that I uh, would want to point out is that the um, tuition has not changed from the 14-15 school year. It does remain the same. We um, extended a grace period, which was 90 days before, to uh, 120 days on any um, lapse or replacement of um, open positions at the villa regarding highly qualified positions or highly qualified teachers. And then there had to be a whole section added regarding clearances, background checks, and employment history review. That's really standard boilerplate language that our solicitor put in, and it has to do with the changes um, under what Act 168 of 2014. And um, lastly, we had some um, um, there is an understanding in here as far as the adoption and the term that the villa plans to relocate sometime during the current year, and maybe Mr. Ogden can speak to that. Um, 
we the last at our last meeting we discussed it, we, we thought it would be um, in March 2016 and that really lists any of the changes there really aren't any major changes um, to the contract for 15-16 we need to move forward with the contract so that uh, we can pay them and uh, some other matters can be taken care of Mr. Ogden does anybody have any questions our, our contracts have been year to year in the past or have they been multi-year they've always been year to year okay. and this contract is it for a year or is it for a period of time to be determined based on whether there's a relocation of the bill um, well it is drawn with the idea that it would that it does conclude or terminate as of June 30th 2016 however it is understood that the villa plans to relocate during the current year okay. uh, is there anything more specific that you can elaborate concerning that Right now, at this point, we're still on schedule to uh, vacate the premises on March 31st. That's the day that our lease expires with them. It could be a couple weeks prior to that, um, but because we'll have some turnover to time to give back to the, the uh, tenants, um, or the landlord, excuse me. Um, but at this point, we're still on track for uh, March 31st. Okay, uh, so with, with your relocation, any of the children still not? Closer. I hear that. Okay, <laughs> I guess I'm just not close enough to it. Okay, so with your relocation, any and all of the children that uh, are being schooled in Upper Dublin, that will terminate, or is that not the case? Right now, the kids who are in the, the district, would, uh, if they're still there at that time, that we would terminate with them. However, we were talking about a few of the seniors um, who would do that, and we want them to finish out the school year here, and then we would figure out the transportation and take care of that. Yes, so that transition would be very carefully orchestrated to allow the seniors to stay and graduate from Upper Dublin with uh, uh, the organization arranging transportation. We recognize that it would be meaningful to them for their senior year, so we don't want to upset that and give them the opportunity to do that. And, and just uh, that is stated within the contract. So for that period of time that the villa no longer is in Upper Dublin and we have those students, is there, uh, is there a tuition that's being paid to the district for those students or that, that they'll just attend gratis? Um, there are, I believe, only two or three seniors that we would anticipate. None of the other students would continue to attend. And it's not uncommon for uh, when seniors transition, move in other instances for them to finish their senior year, particularly when it's that close to the end of the year. I can't remember the board policy, but I'm sure that it's covered by that. Yes, we have, we have uh, checked board policy. And... Uh, Everyone, um, folks at the villa, the administration, everyone believes it would be in the best interest of those several youngsters to finish out the school year here. I think that's generally been our tradition with other instances, too. Correct. I, I did have occasion to uh, look at the policy around this recently, not for this purpose, but it's, I think it's number 200 and 202. And, uh, and they do say that there is an opportunity for the superintendent to make exceptions to the tuition requirement. So that, that would be the mechanism by which that would happen. But again, we have addressed it in the contract. Are there any other questions? Yeah, um, two, I have a question first and then a comment, of course. Uh, we're saying right now March 31st looks like would, will be the date. Uh, when would we know... Is there a date that you'd be able to tell us for sure that it's March 31st? I mean, like February 1st or March 1st or March 30th? <laughs> I, I would think that we would be able to give you some notice prior to that, but I couldn't nail down a day, actually, and say, like, by this day, because we're dealing with licensing agencies and state folks, so there's a lot of stuff that goes in there, a lot of moving parts, so to say. 
um, but we would give you at least uh, a couple weeks notice because ideally I'd want to do like a 30 day notice and say hey we're on track for this okay. because we have to deal with some of the other kids and give them a smooth transition to do that so that's our intent is to try to let everybody know yes this is the, the day it's going to happen well ahead of time so we can work with the kids to make sure it's not a culture shock to them as well right Okay, and then, then just a comment. And I've, I've, I mean, I've, I've been on the board for 16 years on and off, and uh, you know, we've had a lot of interaction with, with, with the villa. And, and I know uh, a lot of times we talk about the issues or the concerns that we've had, and, but I do know that there's been a significant number of success stories of students that came to Upper Dublin. And, and I think that's more important than anything else that, that has occurred over the years. And if we were able to you know, communicate, reach out, and make a handful of students, or whatever number of students that, that, that went through our doors, you know, more successful, or more positive, and, and a better outlook on life, I think you know, that, that's the good thing about this. And so even though we are going to be saying goodbye, I mean, I look back at the success stories that we've had with those young uh, men and women, and, and thank you for everything that, that, that the institution has done for them. Well, thank you very much. I I can't tell you how much we value the partnership. Um, I know that the children who come here get a very quality education. They have opportunities that they might have not got in their home schools uh, before they came here. So we're very grateful for that. And I know that it's made a huge impact on them. Yes. Thank you. And, and one last point. Um, Mr. Ogden has signed the contract already and um, after I'm sure appropriate legal review so I have two copies of the signed contract which we will certainly make sure all board members see before the the upcoming December 14th meeting and this will be a motion uh, on that agenda anything else no thank you thank very you. much thank, thank you. you very much thank we'll you Mr. Ogden thank okay. you thanks Mike thank you All right, Mrs. Bray, shall we go on to uh, Phil's presentation, or do you have do you want to go with something else pending the bond presentation? Since I've not um, received any phone calls, text, perhaps we can certainly go on to Phil's presentation. Um, I'm not sure how long it would be. If we want to, we can uh, go on and discuss the Moody's um, Bond rating. Well, I would vote for Phil. Okay. Himself. Then, <laughs> then let's take one of the presentations Phil. and go back. <laughs> so, uh, we now have have um, a presentation by Philip Vinogradov, uh, our technology expert, and uh, concerning the 2016-2017 technology budget. Doesn't matter. There we are. All right. Um, so um, the uh, the documents that um, were shared in draft, right? These are uh, working documents, and I want to essentially this is an opportunity at this very early stage of of budget development to uh, share context and sort of the mechanisms by which that budget process is happening, especially uh, with technology. And, and Ms. Bray and I have talked. Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity to sort of, as a new day um, and a new person here, um, and also a very new initiative to, to look at this, but the nuts and bolts of this budgeting process. Um, so I, I like to always step back rather than just dive into spreadsheets and just sort of like talk holistically about budgeting and, and specifically the technology department, right? So technology is really at the heart of so many aspects of this institution, operations, administration, most importantly, teaching and learning. The responsibilities of my department is to look at the systems that support all of that um, and <clears throat> to have mindfulness of consistency, compatibility, um, sustainability, and where are our opportunities for innovation and forward thinking. And so a budget is a tool for doing all of those things, um, for bringing up my line items, for asking questions about those line items, for thinking ahead with respect to those line items. 
Um, so I shared two documents. One was uh, an example from Spring Ford School District, much larger. Their budget looks a lot larger. Those are all the line items and big detailed numbers. But that's a, an example of something that we're looking to build as a tool. And often, you know, those, these budgetary tools, um, they're exactly that. They're the internal tool that you use as you're planning um, and you're uh, coordinating with your colleagues and other departments. And then I have for you this preliminary draft, right? And so that becomes the draft through which we are thinking and asking questions. Uh, what are our instructional goals? What will they look like moving forward? What do we need to support that? What are our administrative systems? What does our network infrastructure need? Uh, what will we need to do? What investments do we need to do to support that moving forward? And also, what are our opportunities? Um, so, to, as for example, today, because I had this tool and I was meeting with the technology directors um, for Montgomery County and we started to have an E-rate conversation, I could jump into the tool and say, I have a question. We spend $50,000 a year on our Sunesis wide area network, and all of us do, in Montgomery County. And under the new E-rate rules, is that E-rateable? Yes, it is, right? That's fantastic news. So already the document that I shared is obsolete because <laughs> we just have $20,000 back in our pocket. Um, and so that's the, the goal of developing this kind of tool. Um, and it reflects input from all of our stakeholders, mostly from that teaching and learning space, um, especially as we have made this huge stride into uh, a digital platform for teaching and learning um, and exploring uh, all of the opportunities there. So that in a nutshell is like this is really just a, a very preliminary here's me for five minutes to say this is the process um, as it begins to unfold and to have this opportunity for feedback, for questions about that process um, and uh, board input in, into um, helping me refine that process and helping us refine that process. Do you foresee any great variance in terms of the amount of money that you'll be requesting um, compared so to previous budget? Yeah, so uh, compare, well, compared to the way previous budgets uh, have been described, right? So we have had this static uh, technology al allocation, right? Which has really reflected what has been built to that account. Um, but it's not, that hasn't captured really all of the investments that we make in technology to support everything that we do here. So this process um, is a way, as a mechanism to capture that, but also to capture the additional investment that we are making in 21st century teaching and learning. Um, and so that we can anticipate and plan for that. Um, and answer in a, a tangential factor, like just why this kind of tool is valuable. Uh, we're going to have conversations with our PTOs and PTAs, right? We want you to do a lot to support us. And it's important to have a tool to say, this is our strategic vision. This is how we're budgeting, right? And so when we have that, that PTO that says, you know, hey, this is great. I, we want to do tablets, you know, <coughs> at X, Y, and Z grade, they all go, we can turn and say, these are investments that the district is committing to. This is the direction we're committing to. We appreciate that partnership. But uh, what are those Kickstarter projects that your funding could go to that you know, are outside of this realm? Right? And that's an important conversation. Maybe it, it may be that a PTO and PTA is going to partner on something strategic that's here to defray some of those costs. And that might be best. Or it may be that they don't because we've budgeted appropriately for that need and now they can support something else. And I think that this kind of tool allows us to have that partnership discussion. May I just add that the agenda for the January 20th combined leadership of PTO, PTA, SPEAK will be there also. Um, our topic is going to center on technology. Uh, Phil will be there, uh, Peter Valachi will be there, and we're going to share our thoughts about it, get thoughts from them, and address some other technology issues. But that's going to be the theme of the meeting, technology, yeah. as we move forward. 
Could you uh, give us kind of an overview of the assumptions here and the categories? Um, you know, how much of this is things that were deferred from last year because we wanted to roll out one-to-one? -one? Um, how much are costs that we just put in regularly, like consulting, or are they for specific things? Um, what else? My sure. other question. Sure. I, I can go through the big categories, right? right? So our, our big categories really are... Phil, do we have this? Do we have a piece of paper? Oh, no, it was shared on the uh, It was shared electronically, yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, the, and the, you know, always electronic is going to be more up to date. Um, so the, <laughs> the big categories are some of those infrastructure expenses, right? Yeah. Um, then there is the licensing for all of those infrastructures pieces. Um, there is the administrative software side. Um, and then there is the... Uh, instructional side, which is often divided into uh, the refresh of equipment and then new and original equipment. Right? So you have all of these these big buckets. Um, so probably the largest you know, increase right away is uh, our leasing of one-to-one -one equipment. Um, and so that becomes this recurring line item, uh, which we evaluate in two years, right? Because, and we have to reassess what that will be like. Um, and that will really be driven by what are our instructional goals, what are the tools that best meet that, and what, what do those tools cost. So that's one yeah. big bucket. Um, and there's expansion that is developmentally appropriate for early elementary, right? That's not a one-to-one, -one, um, but it's enough devices that are there and available and accessible to, to teachers so that the barrier for digital access uh, is removed. So, so that was one of my other questions was going to be about the assumptions for how many devices we're going to get for the lower grades and how they will be shared if they're going to be shared. And So this year is a year where we're really evaluating what do we need. Uh, we don't want to invest in more device than we need. Uh, we, but we want to remove that barrier to access. Currently, right now, it's looking like uh, what would be appropriate for grades two through four is uh, a two-to-one ratio. So that's a, one device for every two kids, um, so that two teachers could have a, a class set of devices, and at that grade, it would be Chromebooks. Um, and then they could divide them uh, with flexibility. I might have enough for half my students so I could do flexible groupings. Uh, some days I might need all the devices for a project and then I flip flop with my colleague. Coordinating with one colleague across the hall is very different from coordinating one laptop cart for the grade, right? So um, the laptop cart for the grade, that's not enough device. Uh, my colleague across the hall sharing that way is, is um, I think, a balanced approach. Okay. For grades, K through one right now, we're evaluating a, um, a tablet pilot at Fort Washington Elementary School. And that looks like right now we're doing six devices in a kindergarten and first grade classroom. So one teacher has six devices. This is essentially for that enrichment, small flexible grouping, um, and using those devices that way. They basically are, are right now preloaded with uh, math, um, fluency apps and uh, literacy apps, right? And so those are, gives that time for that differentiated practice for that kid. The, we look at uh, professional development services, uh, consulting, um, E-rate consulting. So the MCIU E-rate has been this line item that we have just always had in place. Uh, systems consulting, when I looked at the ledgers, this is by example of, of what has been billed over the past few years, there was always this consulting service. And we'd often bring in anywhere between some years $6,000 worth of consulting, some years more. Um, and so again, this is a draft document. And so it says, on average, this is about how much we do. Let's just start to identify it. That on average, we, in a given year, will have something unanticipated and we'll bring in somebody in their expertise for that purpose. Um, we have our smart nets. So this is the uh, my re insurance policy, right? Like I 
oh my God, it went down, and we need somebody here tomorrow with replacement equipment. Um, so we have that in place. Um, and they're never $12,000. They're, they're on different cycles. So some year, depending on the year, some years it's less, some years it's more. Um, one thing that we are working on is consolidating those, so getting the timing of them better. Um, that's just for budgetary convenience. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the administrative software, right? So that's just this, you know, licensing for everything from our, our filters and firewalls and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and everything that has an asterisk there, because under the new E-rate rules, the, everything in the pipeline from the internet to my device, I can apply for that E-rate discount, um, including large capital expenditures. And so we scroll down, and, and that's where you see uh, our, our firewall and our elementary gateways. They all go to end of support this June. So we need new ones. Um, the timing is great. Uh, we could have done it last year, but we deferred uh, in part because of the one-to-one, -one, but also because we knew that if we did the request for proposal and went through the E-rate process, we get back 40% on those um, capital investitures. So that's, we wanted to wait and defer. And um, with the gateway switches in the elementary, there's a lot of knocking on wood, whether it's real wood or not. Uh, we needed to last till June. The um, pieces like the data projector refresh uh, the classroom workstation refresh, right, to say what's a, what's a reasonable, balanced refresh cycle. I mean, we'd all love new and shiny right away. We can't. Um, but with projectors, we can look at a fifth of the projectors in the district, um, uh, a quarter of that, those teacher classroom. We still have cathode ray monitors, right? So there's updating that needs uh, and TLC that'll need. And so we budget responsibly for what that will look like. Uh, we think ahead, right? And there's time we're going to start to need to update our access points, right? So we start thinking when when will we start to do that in in the cycle, um, and those upgrades and those expansions are are e rateable now, um, and so those are the the big buckets, uh, okay. Dr. Ludwig, that we're considering, um, and uh, so this is a tool simply for doing that, for reflecting on those. Um, now, with this tool in place, right, I can get ready to start the next piece, which is the wonderful request for proposal. The request for proposal is for uh, the E-rate equipment? For all the E-rate equipment, right, right. And to go through that process, um, and which I hear is just so much fun. Yeah, I'm really, <laughs> really looking forward to it. I'm sure you're looking yeah. forward to it. Well, in the uh, past, I know we worked with the IU to put those Together. Yes. Is that, that's so I do the hard work of identifying uh, the hardware and systems that we want. The more detailed I am in that bid, the better it is for us. Um, then uh, we pat. That's why we pay that uh, three thousand dollars a year to the IU. They do right. a lot of the the E-rate filing for us, um, and so those do that that work for us as well. Do you know what we got this year with E-rate? I I do not know the amount. Um, this year is very different than moving forward. I understand that. And is uh, the pot bigger? Uh, the pot is bigger yeah. for a while. You're right, and everyone's going to jump into that right. pot right now. Um, but so the pot is bigger, but it's also what you can, right? So where it was before, yeah. it was phones. Yeah, this right, is. now it's, it's my Sunesis, right? That's huge. Yeah. And under the old method, um, because of the way we're required to account for E-rate, which is very different. Um, you've all heard me say repeatedly, we always have to keep revenue separate from expenditures. Well, um, E-rate's an exception. You actually do offset the expenditure for the cell phones and those type of things. So it's not quite so easy, unless you're looking at the checks to follow through. So um, I, I get that this is the expenditure budget, but I was also wondering if when you present this, you present with like offsetting revenues, like what the families are paying. Right, uh, and and so we can't say you know we can we can definitely look at here are the revenues, right? Um, uh, and it would be interesting as well to have a separate you know mini addendum, which was um, what what are we not paying for anymore, right? So there are some cost savings that, there, right. shifting from last yeah. year. Um, 
shifting over to Google saved us. Um, so there's systems that we're not paying for anymore, licensing that we're not paying for. So those are items. Um, uh, I've more than uh, replaced the, <laughs> those expenditures, right? Um, and then there's, uh, but about yeah, the so website the revenue, that you're doing in right? And so the revenue piece comes in and that yeah. revenue piece doesn't necessarily turn around directly to support a line item here. We can't do that, but we can say here, we have this regular revenue coming in that, from that the technology That would be nice feed. to see as we see the expenditures and. Sure. sure. But we're going to need on that. I think Michael mentioned it earlier. We, I think what you're doing now is we, we had the technology budget 450,000. 475. 475. 475. You got a bonus. Years. Okay. Yep. And, but then other stuff was all over the budget that we actually did for technology. But we need to see somehow <laughs> what that amount was that was all over. Because the bottom line is I, I, you know, I want to know how much more the budget is. So you can't tell by looking at this and looking at the 475. So what did we really spend on technology this year and how much more? So this does reflect those big buckets that were in this year. Mm -hmm. This, this yes. reflects all those big buckets. Um, so, you know, when you look at this jump, um, I, I see 16, it starts with 16, 17, right? 16, 17 is next year. Um, right. And so this year's, uh, we had, um, and I presented that in the fall and I can have that, or presented that last spring, the sort of yeah, breakdown. It and it was just the big buckets, the um, administrative software bucket, the instructional technology budget bucket. Um, and the financing here for Chromebooks this year was a combination of the technology fee and a freeze on our refresh um, right. and partnership with the Ed Foundation. And those pieces together allowed us to do a one-to-one -one launch this right. year uh, with an understanding that, that you can't freeze your refresh indefinitely, right? So now this has the refresh back. Um, it also has the addition of our desired expansion for uh, early elementary. Um, it uh, also has the infrastructure pieces. So those are those three big pieces built on. We've, we've now said we're bringing back the hardware refresh. Um, and the hardware refresh that we had in place was not large enough. I'm, I'm good with all that. Yeah, yeah, I know you're good. I'm just trying to explain <laughs> like, those are those big buckets. But I, I want to know, just like you have this broken down for the next three years, do you have the same thing for this year? Uh, I can create it. Yeah. I know, I know there will probably be a lots of yeah. manipulations because you have to back out. And I have it for in. last it's year. Mm -hmm. And then I have it for, and right now this year is, is unfolding. Uh, but I know right. I can present to you what's been allocated okay. for. And for the big number probably in, is that in, first in line, right? The 448 line is the one that you don't know what that amount is yet. The revised renew. Oh, the lease the, hardware. Oh, for 1819? 1819. 1819? I, yeah. So I think, can I, can I, so I think to answer the, what I think you're getting at, Art, is, um, so if we look at the at the bottom line down here, 840 next year, 730, 724, those are not directly, what you're saying is those are not directly comparable to the 475 that we've been right. talking about in the past. How much higher is it really than, than we've been spending? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, you know, it's not, we don't just subtract 475, we subtract something more than 475. It's still an increase. I mean, there's no question mm -hmm. this is, you know, more than before. Yeah, but it's, but it's not 400,000 it, more. It could be right. 100,000 more. Yeah. That, that it would be nice to see it with maybe against last year, this past year's budget, and also with the at least what you know in terms of offsetting revenues because the lease payments, I mean, we're, unless we change the program, that's pretty easy. Now, it may be that we don't know for sure at foundation PTOs, potentially you know other gifts or whatever. Um, yeah, and that and that's again step, back to back to this kind of a tool yeah. makes it easier because I can go back and say, okay, for each of these categories, what did we spend last year? What do we what do we budget for in these categories this year? Um, and then when I go back to last year, I can put in 
all the red line items. Right. What did I take out? Uh, what are we not paying right. for anymore? Right. Um, switching from Evolve IP to the IU for our internet, for example, is a, is a, is a shift in the savings. Right. So we can have those too, and, and you can see those offsets. So when you think back to uh, Mr. Sirota's point, that when I have a, uh, if I, so that we can do more of an apples to apples comparison, right? Because right now, if I were to just subtract yeah. 475 from this number, it doesn't quite reflect no. the difference. Um, but back to Mr. Sirota's point, it is a significant increase because the landscape has completely changed. And, and we, we all recognize and appreciate that, but we just want to be able to articulate what exactly that increase is. Right. Yeah. It, I guess one other thing, if you're sharing the document, I mean, you're sharing it, I guess, as a PDF, not as a spreadsheet. But if you could just, you know, the buckets, add them up. <laughs> so you could, you could see what oh, all the, sort the of sums were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, it's just a niceties. Then you can, we can kind of compare and sure. look at it by buckets. By buckets meaning what? You like the, the 768 like total? Column B, the account. The yeah, account by account. By account. Well, yeah. As, as much as the accounts assuming. go into those big buckets, then yes, by accounting totals. But I'm really more interested in conceptual buckets, like the refresh, the uh, oh, okay. educational software. I mean, in the categories that make sense to. I could put those in a pie chart, too. <laughs> Not accounting. You know, that just helps, uh, you know, because no, that's how I think, actually, right? Like, I just, okay, here's this pie, and no, how much is in the refresh? How much? Yeah. I mean, it's just how much is in yeah. each one. So that um, it just makes it easier to kind of get your head around what, what the categories are that have changed. Okay. I do support. Increasing the technology budget. I'm not. Oh no, and saying I, that. I, and and uh, school board has only you know affirmed. I that, mean, I think um, what you've done everybody. is yeah. amazing yeah. this past year. I mean, I've been in the classroom and seen some of the kids. In fact, today doing cahoots in the elementary school, not in the high school, but in the <laughs> in the elementary school, and how engaged they were. And yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's fantastic. It's um, today we had. Um, Technology director and curriculum director from Abington School District coming to visit to see um, how we did what we did, um, looking to replicate the model. Don't so, tell them. Don't tell. Them. Yeah, so that's that's very <laughs> flattering. Um, it's it's great. Um, <laughs> and, and and the support for all of this is is yeah. is unanimous. It's, um, it's the next is the okay. Now we have to pay for it, right? right? And figure that out together. And that's that's the good work here that we're doing. Right, but. That's why, at least when we have a, a larger meeting with more people, not a rainy night, maybe there'll be three people in the audience instead of one, <laughs> um, so that we can kind of explain that it's not 400,000 more. We have all these offsetting revenues that, right. and what they are, and so what the jump really is and what it goes for in terms of buckets. And sure. that will certainly be part of our larger budget conversations, but I think this is a taste of how we're looking to begin to present the budget in a different right. way, not just limited to technology. And it will take time to roll it all out, but we're trying to. And I, I understand adding um, last year, current year, to date, et cetera, mm -hmm. that, that certainly will give us more information. So it's a work in progress, mm -hmm. and we're yeah. starting with technology, and we have to salute uh, Phil and yeah, Brenda for their work on this. But uh, again, this is where we're headed for more transparency across the board, and just to make it a more user-friendly document as we go through the process. What, what, what confused me and, and Robert was, uh, you know, we, we don't know what, maybe the committee knows, but or the education, we don't know what the proposal is for next year. I mean, we've talked about it on one-to-one, -one, but we've never talked. I know we're throwing out some ideas about bring, you know, bring the technology down, but I don't think we've talked about that at a public meeting in yeah, terms of what we're thinking about doing next, next year. Right. We certainly have need that. We've talked conceptually, right. but not, we haven't brought a number, I don't believe. No, no, I, I don't think we've yet. talked about what we're doing uh, in, and in the elementary schools at a community, yeah. at, a, at, a, at a board meeting. Yeah, and I, I think that it's um, definitely between uh, technology, curriculum, buildings, administration, faculty, um, 
the, all those discussions, uh, even PTOs, those discussions are happening and they're uh, exciting. I think that they are still very nascent because we're evaluating and learning. Um, but it, I, I would believe that um, the education committee would be a great place for Ava and I to come together uh, with right. uh, a draft vision of what it will look like, and then we can iterate and update that right. draft vision as the year unfolds, and that would complement this budgeting process. So I'm not really sure when that should happen, but um, at least tentatively it's in a couple default places on education committee um, agenda. And so maybe we can decide what what month makes the most sense sure. for having that presentation. Early, early and often, I like. I guess, <laughs> if, if I may, because if this is a model for how we're going to do things, this is some of those comments were directed at Phil. Some are kind of my more general comments. I mean, it would be nice. I mean, this is really nice to see this. So, you know, one one thing that would be nice to have with each one of these areas would be a one page that goes in front of it which tells conceptually what it is, what we're doing, what we're doing differently. Um, in this case, you know, the things that I asked like what ratio are we going, you know, what, what's, the, what's the concept? Now, I mean, if we're talking about, I don't know, the social studies budget, you know, how many teachers do we have? What are we changing from last year? What's the curriculum, I mean, just a summary, a bullet page summary of conceptually what it is that makes up this budget, what are the changes that we're looking at, and what are the items that are kind of only if we can afford them, and what are the really necessary things that we have to do all the time and we really have no discretion over. It, to do that by program, I find, has always been very helpful in organizing it, so that certainly can be in addition to the entire budget document. And I would just ask for patience as we move through the first year of doing this, and particularly since it's an accelerated year, we may have to mm -hmm. do what we have to do publicly uh, under Act 1 and um, Pennsylvania Act School. One? What's that? Didn't yeah. that go away? <laughs> oh my and, and, and Pennsylvania <laughs> School called 687. Um, but I think this is great, and uh, uh, Dr. Wheeler was very kind to acknowledge me, but um, Phil's the first area that's really <laughs> grabbed hold of this, and, you know, um, what it, we, we've had a lot of conversations back and forth, several today, uh, about how we want to present everything. And I think I've, I understand what you want, um, almost um, a guide to the budget. We have to do certain presentations. It's required under, um, again, School Code 687, but this helps make it more user-friendly. That, that's really what I'm trying to get at. I'd like to um, call attention to a couple things. One is, uh, thank you. This is fantastic. I love that this brings so much more of the technology into one view, and um, and that it's a multi-year view, uh, and that is, you know, is a huge step forward. Um, you'll notice as we look at the bottom line that you know we noticed the first year on, on this three-year plan is much higher. That's because there's a bunch of one year or first year type of expenses in there um, for hardware licensing um, and uh, some some of the nature of the refresh cycle. Uh, there's other some of those one year items. I have a question. Um, you know, it's not like they're really one year items. They're just you know every five year kind of items. Um, can, is there some way to call that out so that we know that? Five years. I'm picking a number, but five years yeah. down the road, that's not going to be a surprise. We're not going to forget about it. Are we? And we that would. I think that would dovetail that? with with Joan's request, which is a guide to the budget. So the cheat sheet, so that it identifies here in this category, right? You see these significant items, and in five years they will come up again. <coughs> we don't project out the five years because it's not the Soviet Union, and and things change quickly. Um, I can say that because I'm Russian. So <laughs> the, the other part is uh, it, 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 an appreciation of this as a tool and a fluid document. So the flip side of it is um, that what you see budgeted for 1718, right, 
I might be sitting here next year and that those numbers would look different. They could look higher, they could look lower because something else came along. We recognize that we have to make an investment now in X, Y, or Z. Um, or 17, 18 could stay the same, but 18, 19 could go up because we identified something. So um, when you know budgets get approved, we're approving annually. The rest of those years are there just for us for the strategic planning. And so you know, I can put in the dot, 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 and this other item will rear its ugly head again in a few years, and because we need a firewall, some w what what that will look like in five years, we right. We'll and if we do that down. this year, then next year in the three-year plan, it won't appear at all. It won't appear. It won't be in the next three years. So right. that's you know that's the yeah. sort of thing I want. And those kind of notes, not yeah. Lose. yeah. May I also offer a caveat? This is subject to change. Everything on this page is subject <laughs> oh, to change yeah. because. We still are working on every other program and department that feeds into the greater budget. So it's a, a static snapshot, but please don't be shocked if numbers look different as we move yeah. forward. Although we do know the lease is the lease. So those numbers well, are the Well, the lease top is the and, lease, and but there's a lot in here because we have so many other um, things to consider district-wide. So it's a start. So I do, bear that in mind, please. I do have a question thinking of this as a start, and I know it, it's a small item, but it's it's an example I want to call out. So there's there's a line item for travel and registration. Um, and that's not explicitly technology, and that happens all over the organization. Um, does it make sense to call that part of this budget, or is there a, just a general larger travel and and um, conference kind of budget that we want to keep track of? Do we want to keep track of that by department? Why is it here? Because all expenses have to relate to a, the particular area. So if it's Phil, if it's certain people regarding technology, it needs to be ch charged to so it, technology. So if, uh, if we send a bunch of teachers to a technology contract, would that be here? Or because they're teachers, they wouldn't be here? It's like when we did ISTE, that was curriculum. Because yeah. we sent a lot of teachers. Curriculum, curriculum. Okay, so that I think goes to sort of what Joan was talking about that, um, you know, then you can't see how much do we spend on conferences if we piecemeal it that way, and I understand we have to piecemeal it that way, but, you know, a guide to the budget that would sort of pull those things together and some, by some other categorization may be maybe yes. helpful. And, and I'm just using this as an example, not as a... Yeah. No, that, that's, that's very insightful, and that's yeah. always been my experience in putting a budget together. Um, you're going to break out if you want to go by accounts and line items and then have subsequent to that bundle things that, not, uh, that appear across the budget and uh, present those as programs separately. Mm -hmm. But it is true. You will see PD in almost every department. Mm -hmm. It's just the way the, the budget rolls out with the line items. But we certainly could um, bundle that as a, just a a piece of information for the board, mm -hmm. separate and apart. Does, does it, that just made me think of one thing. It says travel and registration. Oh, registration would be the cost of the PD itself. So right. it, does, it does include conference fees. Mm -hmm. everything about conferences. Okay. Right. And, and that number, you know, it's again an example of a tool saying, what did we do last year? Um, and so there were conferences attended by myself, uh, conference attended by Brad Lieberman. What did that come out to? Okay, so will I attend those conferences again? Yes. So just planning that way. Yeah. But here's another example of how difficult it is in Pennsylvania and a lot of places. Well, we're talking about um, travel and registration. Uh, it doesn't include if you're flying on airplanes or mileage and those type of things. That's uh, object 580. So there's, we'll, we'll need to have, you know, conversations, and this may be a multi-year process to get to where we want. But this is more or less registration that we're talking about that under 324. Okay. It, it, it's not easy. It really isn't. No. Are there any other questions? Um, that was five minutes, right? Isn't that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> you can never invite me and I expect that it's going to go fast. I, I, just, yeah. I just want to talk again to the Education Committee and, and to Mark. It's just, are we planning then to have something sh in, in, at the next education committee meeting where we're going to talk about where you see next year? See, it's, we're like 
it's like the cart before the horse. We have a budget, but yeah, we haven't talked about what the model is going to be for next year in elementary school. But there's so a you know, preliminary budget here. So and we have to do the preliminary budget so early, but we still have to talk about what we think. But yeah, it's hard to do everything that you want before the preliminary budget because then you'd want all the curriculum areas too. Right. And it'll probably take all year to get through all of those. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't. Um, True. Well, and, we and go back to the curriculum yeah. summit that we just had, mm -hmm. which we will have again in the spring. It's I believe spring. we're planning to do that twice a year yeah. moving forward. Yeah. And that provides a nice overview of what the content coordinators are thinking for the future. And, and it, it brings us back to the point that Dr. Wheeler made of, of this being very fluid, right? So I'm going first in this process, but there are many you know, components in this, um, in this enterprise of Upper Dublin. And um, you know what I put together here was a very uh, bare bones. Even though it's big, it's it's you know when you, we talked about the nice to have versus need to have, it was how bare bones can I be and meet our existing commitments now? You know our, our, the refresh cycle uh, that we suspended for this year to bring it back. We're bringing it back very frugal um, and and just spread over time. But again, and that might change, right? But that's only changes if after we've satisfied all of our, our different but needs. See, technology is a little different. I, I know what you're saying. We can't do all the curriculum areas. But technology, we're, we're going to talk to the Ed Foundation, the PTO, PTAs, talking about next year. And it needs to be vetted first by the board in terms of what we're going to be doing next year. The other stuff, not as much. But, you know, tablets and, you know, are we going to mm -hmm. do tablets in K-1? Are we going to do, you know, uh, the Chromebooks in two, three, four? We haven't had any discussions on that yet. So early next week, we're going to talk about the agenda. Um, at least a couple things that might need to be on it. I think there's some things about guidance and program of studies that mm -hmm. have to be on yes. now yeah, yeah. because they have to be they're discussed and improved yep, yep, because sure. they're time sensitive. Right. Um, probably the SPP and the data, which now mm -hmm. we have. Uh, we need to talk about, I mean, there are a number of things already that um, might, I mean, it, it might be good to have it this month, but maybe there'll be too many things in it. I mean, are you really pushing for it well, as soon as possible? Th well, I mean, I see tablets here. I, I, you know, we need a discussion. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I feel comfortable with bringing it, moving it down a little bit. I don't know how many grades we should move it down just yet. And I'm, I'm not sure if we should do tablets at the same time in, in K-1. You know, to me, that's, that's important because if we're going to the PTO, PTAs, mm -hmm. telling them to help purchase right. tablets for K-1, I'm, I'm not sure that's where, do we do it all again next year or do we just, just do the, the, the three, four, five next year? So it's, it's important, but I understand that there's so much. Two, three, four, you mean? Two, three, uh, two, three, four. Yeah, well, I'm not, yeah. I would have done we know three, what you three, four, <laughs> but two, three, four. Okay. Two, three, four, or or whatever. I'm I mean, not sure. I'm not sure yeah. it should be doing done too. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, I saw the Chromebooks used this week, amazingly in, in in third grade. When you when you talk to the teachers, they say this is a good, this might be the good year to start it in third grade. But you would know better, and we haven't had the discussion in terms of, do we do it in second grade, and do we do we need tablets? You know, in K-1, I don't know if we need tablets. You, you'd know better than, than me. Or should we, you know, stay away from technology for a while and get it, bring it down? But those, those discussions would, would affect what we're telling the foundation mm -hmm. and PTOs and PTAs. Okay. And well, any other money we can get. We can continue this <laughs> yep. offline and um, look at what the, the schedule should be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. All, part of, all part of budget development and developing a, a working format for us but, in future years as well as we change to this. Being around, walking around the elementary schools this week, it was, um, and, and the middle school, and the high school, but it was amazing how you walked in and they were just using the book. They were just using the Chromebooks like right. they've always been using the Chromebooks. Right. It's like it's not, it wasn't new. Right. They were just using it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty it's awesome crazy, to see. Yeah. And, I, and I really appreciate and I think that curriculum is a great place for us to begin those discussions mm -hmm. to involve our teachers, right? Um, because they're the ones who are asking, right? Those, those tablets are in K-1 because the teachers have very specific 
I need to access Imagine Learning. I need to access RAS Kids. Um, and then, so what is, what is the right balance in that space? I think that's an important conversation to have um, and to research and evaluate carefully. Um, so, and that's what the budget reflects, a, hey, here's a, here's a bare bones minimum. If we're gonna do something in that space to support just a little, this is what it would take. Um, the number could change, or we could go slow in that space. But yeah, this is it's nascent right now. Great. Thank you again, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Mrs. Bray, do you want to take us to our next topic? <laughs> Ms. Doyle, after battling the weather and everything, and traffic. Did you come in your you? canoe? or? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm always trying to come home from the airport. And Thank you. Michael, uh, Lily's is not able to attend Thanks. because of the traffic, correct? Thank you. Yes, that's correct. Well, thank you. Is this a, is this a, no, yes. Just thank this you. Blue cover. The document that I just passed out contains the results of your first step of your refunding plan. And I think you're going to be really pleased with the results this evening. If you look at page one, you'll see long-term fixed interest rates continue to be well below historic averages, as we've been talking about for the last couple of months. Uh, that's all good news for your opportunity today. The next couple of pages, pages two through and including eight, are your Moody's credit rating report. So I would encourage you to read that at your leisure. Uh, but the good news is you did an excellent job of maintaining your AA3 credit rating, which is, is above average. Uh, you will see at the top of page two, more toward the middle of the page actually, uh, the A3. That's the state intercept rating. Your rating is, is much better than that, but the investors out there still want to see that state intercept rating, even though it's all the way down to an A3 these days, uh, just as belt and suspenders. So that is, uh, is nothing but, but good news in there. I would point out near the top of page number three, Moody's recognized your strength as a sizable tax base, uh, proximity to job centers in Philadelphia, and limited reliance on state aid, which of course is especially important these days <laughs> in light of the state budget impasse. If you look at page number nine, this is the summary of the plan, and now column one is labeled actual, the blue column. And to cut to the chase, net savings to the school district came in today after negotiating with RBC at $700,728. So if you were to compare that back to our handout in, in November or the last time I was here before that, it's about $100,000 better than what we were projecting. So we were very pleased with those results. Settlement is scheduled to occur on December 22nd, so right before the holiday season. Tablets. And the red column, step two, is still labeled estimated. We won't be locking that in until January. That needs to be a separate calendar year for this bank qualified plan mm -hmm. to work. So again, just to walk through the mechanics, on page 10, you'll see all of your 2008A bonds. So if you did nothing, you'd keep making the payments on page 10. Page 11 is the portion of those 2008 bonds that will refund with today's transaction. So it's the longer end of the transaction and, and a little bit of bonds up front just to get the savings to be where we want them. Page 12 is labeled bonds remaining after this refunding and that's what's available uh, for us to refund a portion of with step two here in a month or so. Page 13 is that restricted yield escrow that we went over in, in fairly great detail. Uh, we were able to lock in the securities in column seven Again, those are called SLUGS. That's an acronym for State and Local Government Series. And I didn't have time to uh, do the final tweaking of this page, so when we get to settlement, you'll see this escrow cost about $70 less than what I'm showing <laughs> on this page. And, and that uh, negative arbitrage number that you see, and, and we always talk about that, uh, that's about $20,000 lower than was originally projected. So that's good as well. You want that to be lower. On page 14, you can see the actual amortization schedule that was summarized previously. You'll see the coupons in column three that we negotiated today, the yields in column four, and those lower coupons and yields are what generate that $700,000 of net savings to the district. 
If you look at the top of column 11, you'll see that you'll recognize roughly $73,000 of net savings in the current fiscal year, roughly $556,000 in the upcoming budget year that you're working on, and then uh, about $35,000 uh, in the 17-18 fiscal year and, and a few thousand each year thereafter. The historic benchmark for a refunding of this nature, again, this is an advance refunding in advance of the 2008A call date, is you want to net at least 3%, and you're netting today 8.41%, so more than double, almost triple the historic benchmark. On page number 15, you'll see the sources and uses of funds, and I would just draw your attention to the middle of the page, that box labeled yield of the issue. That's the rate we'll report to the IRS. You're effectively refinancing this portion of your debt portfolio at just under 2.8%. Very attractive results. On page 16, you'll see your updated debt portfolio. So the bonds that we're refunding with this step are, are deducted from column two. And we've added column 11 to reflect the general obligation bond series of 2015. Again, that principal amount is 8740000 because we left room uh, for the lease that you entered into uh, in your $10 million calendar year limits. So again, I was very pleased with the process, very pleased with the outcome. Uh, thank you very much to the administration that there were uh, credit rating calls and due diligence calls and, and all kinds of uh, activity that went on behind the scenes to result in, in the successful numbers that are before you this evening. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, not a question, but just uh, I noticed on the cost, we didn't uh, require bond insurance. So Correct. do you want to sp speak to that a little bit? No, sure. Because that, that could be an additional expense. That's a great observation. You'll see on page 15, bond insurance zero. That's a testament, again, to your excellent AA3 credit rating. Uh, and, and we evaluate that. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if the investors, in some cases on a double A3, that can go either way. Right. Sometimes yeah. investors are looking for a bond insurance policy as an extra layer of protection. In your case, they, they did not need that bond insurance policy, which you ultimately pay for if it's needed. Uh, so that also helped with the savings today. So keep up the good work. And Jamie and Long, could you give a range sometimes of what bond insurance can cost? Uh, for a transaction of this size and length, I would say it's in the twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollar range. So it's it's meaningful. Thank you. It sounds like we did very well. Absolutely. So page fifteen. Page fifteen shows us all of our costs. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. And they're already netted out of the savings that right. was sized yes. accordingly. Right. Okay. Do we do we have these the the amount that Jamie brought to us in terms of the savings for the anticipated savings versus what we're actually saving? Do you have last weeks or last months, whatever that I amount do. was, maybe so maybe for the Gazette that to show that you know that we were anticipating a certain dollar amount and it ended up being whatever. Sure. We were anticipating $602,160 of net savings, and we actually ended up at $700,727, so roughly $100,000 better. Great. And just as a comment that after Jamie, so to speak, um, the debt that you look at on the back is what we will put into the preliminary budget. So that savings will be reflected the appropriate amount for next year. And, and just as a comment, the, these are, even though the savings materialize over three years, the current year, the next budget year, and the following year, uh, they are, in effect, upfront one-time savings. So I would encourage you to use them for a one-time type of expenditure. Uh, otherwise, it'll feel like an increase when your, right. your debt portfolio has right. to get back up to normal Unlike the after 1. that Unlike the $1.4 million year. that we have, that we retired last year 1.4 million in debt that's a yearly savings Correct. this 556 yes. is a one year savings a very good candidate to be put um, into yeah, to be transferred the debt service or capital but whatever. there can be lots of conversation about that Jamie's quite right we needs to go for something either um, with a longer life not um, one-time cost right. expenditure um, 
capital, let's say, of some sort, or it could be transferred. That would be the best uh, economic and accounting. Oh, we can transfer these savings? I wasn't sure. We could transfer these savings to debt service? Yes. At a next year's budget. Not this year. You're, I think you um, might be confusing in your mind what we could have done if we would have tried to take all the debt service out in the first year. Right. But couldn't if we would have saved all that money in the first year, we, we could have put it into debt service? No, because we made the big payment. We had budgeted the amount of money in the, right. in the budget. Right. Okay. But we cannot, the point is we don't want to build it, um, just spend it on operating expense because it is a one-time savings. Right. And buses. So are we limited right. in how we can use it, or is that just recommended in terms of what we decide I, to I'm do? I'm not bond council, but if bond council were here, uh, <laughs> particularly the, the savings, the 70... Three. Three th 73,000 in savings in the current year. Mm -hmm. Bond Council would like to, you to use that on something capital in nature. That's, yes. that's what I was wondering. You have I more we flexibility in the in moving. budget year 16, 17 in how you you handle that because, you know, you have in your, your debt running rate a number and now you're going to pay out $556,000 less. So, you know, what you do with that in your upcoming budget can be a transfer to a reserve or something else capital in nature, yet you have a little so, bit more So the first year is different mm -hmm. yes, in terms yes, of how you handle it. Okay. But that was one of the, the, we had discussion about that several times, but the way the timing we finally settled, it was after we'd made the payment and, okay. you know, a number of issues. We took this uh, first year savings from a, I think at one point we were discussing $400,000 and now it's down to 73. Mm -hmm. uh, a bus. A micro bus, something yeah. along that line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So will you be coming back to the Finance Committee with a recommendation for that money? Um, as, as you unfortunately aren't aware, this morning we were discussing at facilities or operations um, when we hope to go out for the bus um, purchases. So yes, it will be I there. I have to schedule my meeting earlier. <laughs> 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 Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Chimaluski has some seniority on me, so that's okay. There you go. Oh, uh, does anyone else have any questions for Ms. Doyle? I, I think your second part is conservative, too, but concerned about what could happen if they do some multiple increases, I guess. I wouldn't but expect multiple I, increases I, I before we can get right. that locked in. Right. And, you know, we've, we've thought about that and planned accordingly. It's the shorter portion, so it has less, a little bit less interest Savings, rate risk. Remember. Right, That's why right, we did right, the right. longer por portion right, first. Right, right. And the Federal Reserve increasing short-term rates can actually help that escrow on the second step. Right. So, and, in fact, it, right. you know, leading up to the December Fed meeting, if you were to look back to the escrow page in prior handouts, you would see that the rates in column seven of the escrow were lower before than they are today. So the market short term is already gearing up in preparation mm -hmm. in case the Fed takes action in December. Brenda, where were we saving most of the money in part two? Was it in next year also? It's not in here, right? I mean, it is in it is. here. If you oh, look savings? at page what number page? nine, nine. Uh, down below at column seven, you can see that's a little bit more spread out. It's estimated to be, I'm just going to call okay, that on average, $135,000 okay. a year, a year. for the okay, next good. four years. Good. So column eight is, is really what you are estimated to have to work with. So instead of it just being one bus, it might be more, more buses, just as an example of yeah. what we can do for the current year. And Jamie, um, we've talked about dates for the second, um, because even though we've just done an official or POS and we have just had a credit rating and we have, <laughs> it all has to be repeated. Yes, yes. So we're, we're looking at, at probably somewhere around uh, the week of January 19th uh, in that vicinity. Would be the sale. Yes, would be the sale when you'd lock rates in on step two. And when you do the the whole behind the scenes credit rating business again um it since it's so close to the first one is there any reason to think it would be different i wouldn't expect it to be different yeah. but 
we still have to go through all, of course. The, all, yeah. all, all the steps. Yeah. But that's exactly what the rating agency will ask. What has changed since last time? Are there any material differences? You know, they'll be very interested in your, yeah, maybe your we'll have June a state 30, budget, 2015 but, yeah. audit, for example. <laughs> yeah. And it would be interesting because obviously, as you know, Moody's um, emailed and called and contacted several times about the November 13th payment. And even, uh, and we're going to go over our Moody's report in a little bit more depth. So I should let Jamie get on the road. But that was part of the conversation. And uh, Jamie was on the call and so was Jen. So they ask about that. And I don't mean to rush you off, but I assume. <laughs> Any other questions for Ms. Doyle? Well, thank you to thank you. you and your team and the RBS team. Thank you. It's our pleasure, and we're happy to deliver these results this evening. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are there any announcements or communications? Um, there are not. Uh, and um, the October 22nd minutes, if I could continue on, have been circulated. And they will be, um, if you have any comments, please direct those to Ms. Evans or to me. And uh, those will be moved forward for approval on December the 14th. All right. Uh, so under uh, finance report and recommendations, discussion items, um, we've already talked about the contract with the villa. We've talked about Moody's. Bond rating, unless you had something else to add to that. Um, there are a few points I would like to make. Um, unlike S&P, Standard & Poor's, they do not assign um, local governments with outlooks. You might remember that uh, over the past, when we had S&P doing our ratings, we had a negative outlook and then stable, and Moody's does not do those at all. Uh, but and they they do clearly lay, lay out, and Jamie already covered strengths and how we can maintain our credit rating and things that might impact it negatively. Um, I was disappointed, and I uh, and, and Jamie alluded to it, that they have to report the state because of the intercept program that's there under 633 of Pennsylvania, um, of the public school code. Uh, it is an insurance factor that if we were to default on our debt, the state could um, withhold our subsidy and make payment to the bondholders. Well, obviously, this isn't a year that that would happen, but we have to disclose the A3 rating, even though ours is much better than that. Is that the Moody Blues? Is that the <laughs> that was good. Probably Google it. And I do think that this has been uh, circulated to all the board members, and hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at it. And that's enough probably on the Moody's rating for tonight. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> um, on that note, yes, as Jen said. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> So, uh, number three, results of the 2014-15 fiscal year. Going Variances. The report. Uh, those should all, I think you should have all of that in your packet. Uh, we just want to hit some of the um, high points. Um, yes, it's in there. Um, and we can talk about this as, as much as you want to. Technically, these are still unaudited statements at this point. Uh, because the, they have not, our auditor has not completed the single audit that will be on November the 30th. We don't have the financial statements, but we do have the journal entries. And Jen has put them into the system and into our computer system, our software. So let's talk about at least the revenue. Uh, let's begin with that. Uh, and I'm sure you may have some questions. And Jen is here to answer some of those details. Um, earned income tax. We continued um, to be ahead of what we had estimated and uh, what we had budgeted um, by about $300,000. Uh, I continued to talk with Berkheimer and uh, to you know, budget and forecast the n numbers as we move forward. That's very positive. That proves that we're, um, things are going well within the community. Real estate transfer tax. 
I, I'm I'm hesitating here because several times last year we had sales that I referred to as one time, uh, you know, never seeing a, a REIT, a real estate investment trust, sell property. And it's happened twice. And we're going to talk about another sale that's happened this year a little bit later on. So we have that uh, positive variance of $161,000. Now, part of that money was transferred by board um, motion to, I believe, the Capital Reserve Fund. Um, and we could summarize and go over that as well. And the real estate, uh, delinquent real estate taxes, those are taxes that are not collected within the current year that they're levied. Uh, they come in through Portnoff usually, uh, or um, through the county, they have a, a minor amount that they um, collect and remit to us. And what else was in there? There was something else. Oh, thank you. Uh, and last year was unusual. You may recall, we're going to talk about Lulu a couple times tonight. You may recall that Lulu last year um, had the assessment was reduced, and we would have owed them a refund. But since they owed us several years of back taxes, what we did was essentially reclass. Um, we didn't send them money, but we had to reclass it as a, a delinquent real estate tax. All book and accounting, but that's what needed to be done. That is highly unusual. Is that that's in here? Yes. Yeah, okay in delinquent under the 6411. That was last year's activity. You may be thinking or wanting to oh. ask me about this year's yeah, activity. Was, okay, right, okay. <laughs> um, and down on uh, the other item I really want to call your attention to is all the way down to 6991, which is a refund of prior year's expenditure. We still had approximately $280,000 that came in from um, reconciliation of uh, medical insurance from previous years. On the other side, the negative aspects, or we were under what we had estimated, you'll notice the FICA and the retirement contributions, the two of those is around $200,000. Um, and when we get in to look at expenditures, you'll note that salaries were less than what we had budgeted uh, and expected them to be. And obviously, because we share, or the Commonwealth reimburses is 50%, if we have a reduction in the expenditure on that side, it will translate into a reduction on the revenue side by 50% of the amount. And again, another point to remember for last year, we budgeted that we would be paying our uh, substitutes as, as we always had in the past salary and, uh, and benefits. And this year, for the year 14-15, we started paying them through a service. So that impacted the amount of PEASERS. It didn't really impact the budget that much. It impacted the classifications. It used to be we paid them $100, which is for simplicity says it was actually $90. And on top of that, then we would charge so much for PEASERS and for FICA. That would be in the 100 and the 200 salaries or 100s function or object and um, benefits, the PEASERS and the FICA would be under 200. However, when we pay them through a third party, it's a totally different object. And now I can see that I'm getting into the weeds. <laughs> uh, maybe I shouldn't ask this. This is no. a, a weedy question. Um, <laughs> I'm fine with it. <laughs> did we, did, I can't remember when we uh, increased what we're paying subs. That's was this it, year. Is it in the budget? Is it reflected in the budget or did we do it after we already approved this budget? Uh, first of all, that impacts the year that we're living in, in 15, yes. 16. But we uh, upped that after the budget was passed. That, that so was that's right. going to have a negative impact on the current year. That's a very good question. I, I, I want to point out, which I always like to point out for, for the newspapers that are in the room today, when you look at the state revenue and we talk about how much the state really gives us, I mean, it looks like they give us $15 million. But when you look at the items for, for our basic ed subsidy, it's 2.5. And for special ed, it's, it's 1.8. If you look at the other items that they give us, it's the gaming money, which Gets it, which is the property tax relief on, on our tax bills, which... About $312. Yeah. And, and then it's, it's the, the FICA contribution, like all employers have to contribute to their share of their... The state does their portion of the FICA. And then most of it is the retirement contribution, which is 4.4. Right, so, right, 5.4, 5.4. 
So the money that they, they give us when the state's talking about the basic funding formula and increasing that, it's, it's out of a 90, 90 million? Mm -hmm. yes. 2.5 is what we can put into our basic debt funding. Well, and to go along that line, most of the state aid, other than um, basic ed funding and special education funding, well, the 1301 and, or the 1305 and 1306 um, wards of the state, that would also be included. Everything else basically below that line is a reimbursement. In other words, we've had to spend something in previous years right. before we receive that revenue. Right. They don't reimburse us any of the charter school costs. Not too. anymore. They used to. Okay. Okay. And 1305, 1306, you said, was, was wards of the state? Is that the villa? Um, Mostly? Or? It, it's, part, it, it's part of it. It's part of it. 200,000. Okay. Okay. And, of course, revenues always briefer because there's far fewer account codes. But if we want to move on, are there other questions? Or are we ready to look at expenditures? The accountability grant, are you anticipating then we're getting the accountability grant again next year? The accountability grant was actually blended in to the current year. Oh, uh, thank you. Ready to learn grant is what it is. Oh. And so right now, um, and I've been trying to keep up, but the, the, the proposals at the state do change almost daily. But we would, we would consider that we would still have that moving forward, uh, the accountability grant being a piece of that. Expenditures. Really, the major variances are in regular education, and you'll see that it's salaries, benefits, and really special education. 2.5% um, off under regular education, approximately, you know, $900,000. 288000 in salaries, um, and then $683,000 in benefits. Salaries, again, for special education, about $78,000. Benefits, $113,000. And I would drop down for a third line um, in special education. Uh, the 300s, what they call personal professional, or purchased professional services, excuse me. Um, part of that positive variance, it, it's, we spent less. So to me, that's, that's a good thing. It's related to the cost plan and bringing our children back and doing more internally uh, within our school district. And the other variances by c category, by function, uh, dollar-wise, are uh, much smaller. I have a question. Please. Um, if we brought down last year's budget in professional services under regular ed, why are we, oh no, wait, where's 2015, 16, that's this year. Uh, if you'll, excellent question, it kind of goes back to the substitutes. If you will look under 1100, um, the line of actual, 14, 15 actual, you'll notice that we budgeted at the beginning of the year 43,800, but we actually, uh, we spent What line is that? 1100, 300. I think that's what you're talking okay. about. We budgeted 438. Okay. Uh huh. And, but we actually ended up spending 376,000. And again, that's the substitutes going from the first two lines to that line. Right. Right. Instead of paying our substitute salaries and the benefits related to those, we paid a third-party vendor. So, I'm still having trouble finding, f figuring out where I am and which column was which. Mm -hmm. But so, um, so our budget. So which which column is the one for sixteen seventeen? I don't. 
We don't have 16. We don't have, we have, we don't have it. Don't. Oh, all right. The, we're, okay. Remember, we're still Never doing mind. the look back. We're looking back. This is the time of year when the business office lives in three different years. <laughs> we still haven't closed out 1415. Obviously, we're moving through the current year, and we're trying very hard to think of 1617. Okay. And this was the really good year. Good news with benefits, because the benefits are so much lower than we anticipated. You know, 682 for, for the 1100s. And well, that was partly true. Um, retirement, again, going back to the fact that we didn't have um, the substitutes for last year. Uh, so part of it is, yeah. A, a going, that's about $200,000 uh -huh. uh, in total uh, benefits between 1100s and, and 1200s, correct? Um, I think you're recalling, again, we're living in three different years. We're mm -hmm. talking about them. The 15.7 percent right. reductions actually for this year that we're living in so we're, we're not ready to t to look at that yet okay okay and the benefits that we used to pay for the teachers that we paid so that was the subs that we paid the benefits were, were most re most of those costs were the health costs no, no those the, those were salary driven they would be retirement and FICA Okay. The only time we would have uh, medical benefits for a substitute would be if they would be a long-term long -term. sub. Okay. So were we paying PEASERS on substitutes or were we not? Yes, we were. When, when, when we were paying them through payroll, we would have to. Uh, and that just went into the PEASERS fund. There was, there was no benefit to the... To the substitute teacher. Well, technically, uh, you know, substitutes could r retire from the system um, at some point in time, or if they resign, they're able to um, file for a refund. Mm. Okay. But keep in mind, a number of substitutes work for uh, various districts, so and they, you know, they may retire. So th they individually build up. PISA credits then? Yes. I have a big picture question. Um, so for last year, if I'm reading it right, and I may not be, the, the revenues were about 900000 roughly above um, budget, and expenditures were about $1.4 million below budget Correct. for a total swing of about $2.3 million. My question is, is that a lot? Well, um, obviously it's a lot of money in the absolute I mean, sense, but when you start looking at essentially $180 million, uh, the percentages certainly come down on, on those amounts. Um, I mean, compared to other years or, you know, is that, ha you know, in terms of accurate budgeting, is that within the realm of reasonable? Yes, yeah. and, <laughs> and, and and actually, let me let me be very um, give you a little bit of information. It's almost seven thirty, so I don't want to um, um, belabor the point. But one of the questions that you ask or is asked by Moody's when you're on a, a credit rating call, they want to know how you build your budget uh, and build amounts that can be transferred, how you build fund balance. And one of the answers is you budget conservatively and you hope yeah. that you have money over at the end of the, uh, you know, that you haven't spent at the end of the year and that you um, don't budget for every dollar you expect to come in the door. Right. Okay. Thank you. Brenda, you said $180 million. The $180 million, how do you get to the $180 million? I'm $90 sorry. million dollars of revenue right. and $90 million dollars of expenditures. Okay, so you're looking at both of those, and that's why it was 2.1 million. So it's 2.1 of 180 million, which is a right. little more than one percent. Yeah, yeah, which is not much. Yeah, yeah. In percentages, it all depends upon how uh, how you're wanting to look at it. I mean, right. certainly a million dollars, and and we we have people yeah, in that come to our audience. That right, but a little less, a little more than one percent is 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 good. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to be very brief, and I don't know that um, we ne we can postpone and push some of these things to next month's agenda, if you like, but I, I do want to address a question that Dr. Ludwig posed to me regarding 
um, food service, if we can uh, turn to that in um, the packet. Um, she very Astutely. appropriately pointed out that um, we had thought and we had transferred money to make sure that our fund balance for food service was um, zero or close to it at the end of the year. But we had this thing coming through called GASB 68 this year. And what GASB 68 required is that uh, the Commonwealth send out or appeasers. The unfunded liability for appeasers was uh, distributed, allocated to every school district uh, across Pennsylvania. So even in our financial statements for the school district, which we still don't have, but th there will be a very large amount that will show up on the financial statements. But they'll be the entity-wide statements. They're not the general fund. They're, they're not what we concentrate. They're not what we focus on um, at any of our meetings. They're the other statements. However, and that works because those are governmental funds. However, food service is what's referred to as an enterprise fund. It's run more like a business. So a small piece of that unfunded liability ends up trickling down to f food service. Now the journal entries to get to that $43,000 net that you see on the second page are millions of dollars. They're a million dollar debit and a million dollar or close to it credit. I, again, I don't want to take a lot of our time, but that's what you see on the financial statements. On the balance sheet, you'll see an amount of about $43,000, which um, ultimately falls to the bottom line. Again, I, th I think the balance sheet under liabilities, I should have put this up on the, the overhead. But just as a point that you might find interesting, and I did not print out all of the um, um, allocations of um, PEASERS, the employee portion for Upper Dublin, net pension liability, $130,096,000. And that's allocated again across every school district, every uh, vocational school, uh, across the Commonwealth. In fact, I think, Art, you and I were chatting, and how much is yeah, Eastern? Yeah, is a little over $12 million. So, so where, where does that show up in our yeah. operating budget? It does not show up, again, in the general saying. fund, it right, okay. in our operating budget. It will so show up on what it was referred to as the entity-wide statements. And when we get our okay. statements, um, I will show you where it uh, is. Um, it is interesting. I think that Moody's and Standard & Poor's totally <laughs> disregard any of that information so because basically it puts all school districts in the Commonwealth underwater. Right. So What's the state's liability? <laughs> you know the answer to that. Um, it doesn't show up on their balance sheet at all because they've allocated it back to the sources or to the recipients or the participants. So, and they, that's also true for the uh, state employees as well. So my other question that follows from that is, now we have an ending negative fund balance. Right. Do we have to make that whole from the general fund? We don't have to um, at this point in time. It's probably a good practice later on, but um, it, it, I've not been told that we need to do that. I think there'll be conversation about that in the future. There are, carry it. there are certain expenses, you may recall last year, um, that they no longer allow the food service fund to um, absorb um, sales or non-payment by students for food service, very small amounts. The general fund does have to reimbu uh, reimburse. And we have, and we've had large dollar amounts, but this is almost arbitrary. Okay. So what's, what's left, um, number four and number five? Correct. What would you, what would you like to do? Um, it's. It seems like it would be wise to discuss four, uh, because we need to get to the preliminary budget soon. Um, so we need to have that in there, right? Uh, as we far as some uh, kind of recommendation for the board uh, for the legislative meeting, if we want to do anything about. Um, 
transfers to capital reserve? You know, I wouldn't suggest that we would want to do it as soon as December. We would want to wait, I think, until after the, the um, state sure. finally passes the budget before we would uh, before I would recommend any uh, transfers. I think we can have the conversation, though, uh, and, and we don't have to do it tonight because it's not okay. something that I would um, bring in December. We've just, again, had some one-time um, amounts of money coming in the door again. Uh, maybe I just need to keep saying it's, it's, it's just one-time activity and the REIT sells another property and we get the transfer tax. Maybe I should keep saying that. Uh, we do have two things. Uh, I want to go back to Lulu Country Club briefly. We're going to have a refund on that due to the fire. Um, so, And that will come out of this year's money. That's going to be about $25,000. And there's also something very different that uh, I don't know that's ever happened in Upper Dublin, or certainly not in a number of years. Um, there was some property, uh, BET, and it went from being 319 to that are going to build houses, and um, three nineteen is oh, excuse trees. Me. Trees, or it could be other farm crops. In other words, it w was sitting basically as vacant land. In Bucks County, that's usually a tree farm. Around here, it can be corn, as I was told, and, and they never pick the corn. But anyway, it it it, it comes to be um, it's farmland. When they start to um, develop it, when they sold it, they breached, that's the key word, the 319 uh, assessment, and all of a sudden it becomes assessed at full value. Um, but it not only becomes, it does not become assessed at full value as of today, it's a six-year look-back period. So it's approximately, um, we have initial uh, calculations on it, that's going to be close to $200,000. It's, it's, uh, and it's not just um, back re real estate taxes, it's interest. And then once we uh, receive notification, there will be an interim bill for this year. So it's about $170,000 in back, uh, back taxes, and that'll be another twenty-five or so for the current year. Again, one-time money that could very neatly be set aside into um, capital or debt service for the future. Did we get that, or do you... Did did we get that 200000 or we, we have not. I mean, obviously, that would show up on our financial statements. I just received notification that it was coming wow. down the pike. So everybody gets, I mean, the township would get yes, their little and so portion county. and the mm -hmm. county. Uh -huh. And Jen? And also during this year, we've had uh, a number in, Jul in July, we had uh, $42,500 of um, real estate transfer tax, um, one being the Ziegler Floral when it transferred ha um, hands. And then the uh, other big month was August when, again, a REIT, um, Real Estate Investment Trust, at the Commerce um, Office Center Drive in Fort Washington Office Park. That month alone, we had... Um, real estate transfer tax on corporate commercial of 231000 So we've had a half a million dollars so far this year, or we will have, of kind of one-time money, just as a thought. Again, don't want to do anything until after they settled the budget. I thought they were getting closer back end referendum, and then today I was reading, and, and it seems like everything's falling apart again. So okay. We've had a good month with the bonds and... Yeah, this is a good, this is a good, this is a good page. This is good. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But we, wow. we went to put it away for a rainy day. A rainy day. <laughs> like tonight. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. And lastly, as far as budget deadlines. Oh, do you have it? Thank you. I'm not going to go through um, our, our basic timelines like we have in the, in the past, but just to keep in mind, because of the short budget cycle, on December the 14th, we're probably we're going to be talking about um, um, next year's budget, obviously. But on January the 11th, um, 
well, excuse me, going back to uh, December the 14th, the board will authorize publication of the 16th, preliminary budget that needs to be out on the street on December the 22nd uh, and authorize advertisement of um, intent to adopt the preliminary budget on January the 11th, really early. But just to, to give you a heads up that those items will be on the agenda for that um, meeting in December, December the 14th. Will you have exceptions? Will you know what they are? Will they be in the preliminary budget? A great conversation. As in the past, what uh, we are going to do is blend in the 2.4 plus the exception at this point in time. That gives us the most flexibility. As we demonstrated earlier this evening, budget's very preliminary. There's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done, and we can trim that. Will, will you know what the exception is, or at least Approximately. Approximately. Okay. And, and um, I think I may have mentioned that last ahead. month that the Peaser's exception, I, uh, 600 and, well, no, that's okay. But it's, it's six, 625,000 in, in that range. But that's calculated based on last year's sheet, and they could always change that at PDE as they did a few years ago. It's less than 1%, right? It's, that's point nine. It's it's close. Yeah, it's projected yeah, point at like point nine four or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I thought. Okay. Yeah, we so saw we that number. Saw it. Yeah. I I think so. It's six hundred twenty six thousand yeah. dollars uh, is what we right. have, and there is nothing for special education this year. Last year it was only thirty eight thousand. Say say that again. Uh, last year special education. Yeah, but the, but we did not take that. Right, it, but this year there's no special. There's work. none. There's that's correct. No special. Questions? Oh, and on the very end, at the very end of the packet that was distributed, well, there's two things that before we hit the very end, I guess, because we're trying to show you some of the balances. You'll notice uh, there's a page called Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, and FAI, financial accounting information. You'll notice that um, they've given us a, a disclaimer, if you will, um, about th these are the monies that you will be owed the Jan on January 4th, 2016, um, but it does not reflect when these subsidy subsidies will actually be paid. Uh, payment will be processed as soon as the budget is enacted. And a substantial uh, approximately $160,000 out of the first uh, one, two, three, four, five numbers, 160000 of that really relates to last year. It was an accounts receivable because the state didn't have enough money in their budget. So that's, we've recorded it. It's in fund balance from last year, but it, again, is a reimbursement for the previous year. And then the transportation um, amounts, um, 35000 8000 and 1000 all relate again to the previous year. So we'll have a lot of money on January the 4th if the budget is settled. So this is what they owe us? That is correct. It includes the uh, PISERS? Is, is it? The last payment, yes. Thank you, Jen. The last payment retirement, 1136000 Is that for last year as well? Okay. Yes, that's, that's for last, last year. That's too. Because they never have enough money to end. They forward fund it the current year, like, Correct. The, like the federal government does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we have not had a chance to bring to you differing treasurer's reports, but we have wanted to at least get into the practice of showing you what the fund balance are for the debt service and those types. So you, you will see that on a monthly basis. Good. And they're just listed very simply there. Are, are we getting plan con money, or is that um, is that frozen? Did we get that? We do. We do well, get have that. we actually received well, any sorry, for this year? Not this year. <laughs> there is no longer a moratorium right. because there is no budget. We still have not received any plan con this year. In fact, Dr. Wheeler just signed off some things that we will send off, and and um, uh, you know, but when we will receive the money will be after the budget is passed. Well, I would really like to move on to community input if we could. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone would like to come forward and speak. Start a line by the podium. Seeing none, we'll close community input. And uh,
call for adjournment. Thank you very Thank you, much. Everybody. <laughs> I, will, I should announce the next uh, Finance Committee meeting is Thursday, December 17, 2015, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. here in the Cardinal Room of the Upper Dublin High School. Thank you all. Thank you. Yep. I know it's a long meeting. Thank <laughs> you.